Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Today we are here for AI symposium, which is followed by hackathon, which is first of its kind in IEEE Bangalore section, which we are organizing. Uh, so we have wonderful support, which we are getting from the very own campus that is CDAC. So along with CDAC, IEEE Bangalore section is very proud to present this AI symposium and hackathon first of its kind. And uh, one wonderful thing which we have decided in the organizing committee is that we'll continue doing this hackathon for every year. Maybe the theme may change as per the current trend, but we'll definitely want to continue and we want support from all of them. This event is well supported by, you have seen there was a lot of logos on the screen. So it is well supported by, of course, CDAC as venue sponsor and other kind of sponsorship. IEEE Bangalore section, uh, Power and Energy Society of IEEE, IEEE Computer Society, IEEE Women and Engineering uh, Society, all these three affinity group and societies are the sponsors for the prizes. Other kind of sponsors we have is Technology Engineering Management Society of IEEE, Vehicle Technology Society of uh, IEEE, and IEEE Site, Special Interest Group of Humanitarian Technology. Most importantly, we also have another uh, event uh, sponsor from the Education Institute, which is Ramaya Institute of uh, Applied Sciences. Uh, with this, uh, Let's start off with the first of the event. I request all the dignitaries uh, to please join. Uh, our inaugural address, uh, Chief Guest uh, Sri B.S. Bindu Madhavasa. So please join us on stage. Dr. Prashant Mishra, who is Senior Scientist at TCS Research, as well as Vice Chair of IW Bangalore Section, please join us. Online, we have Dr. S.D. Sudarshan, uh, who is Executive Director of CDAC, who will be joining us online. And uh, we also have Dr. Dinesh Babu, who will be joining us shortly from IIIT Bangalore. We have Dr. Naveen Kumar, who is Professor at Amrita School of Engineering. Sir, I request you to join us on stage. We have uh, with us uh, Dr. Divya, Joint Director at CDAC, and also who is our Execom member of IEEE Bangalore section, please join us on stage. Before we go further, let me tell you a little bit about how we started this event. One fine day, one of the Saturdays, we were traveling from Bangalore to Mysore for one of the IEEE events. At then, we were 10 of them, we were going in a private bus, and that's when we started discussing what else we can do for our students' community along with industry partners and IEEE Bangalore section. That's when Divya Ma'am, who was leading this, who is leading this event, she came up saying, why don't we do an hackathon? Then Prashant said, we'll do something related to AA for social good, but because that's what's trending. That small instigation which started at that time, and now we are seeing the light of the day for this uh, big mega event which we are doing here. AI for social good is nothing but tackling uh, challenges which is posed due, during, I mean, uh, related to social, environmental, and public health. So we are solving all this kind of challenges using artificial intelligence. One way, thanks to COVID, that lot of developments have happened uh, in the uh, past uh, couple of years, so that AI also have become booming. So with this, uh, we'll have first thing, which is uh, invocation song by Ananya, who is a student at Diane and Sagar University. Vandi Subudadi Ali Gananatana Vandi Subudadi Ali Gananatana Sandi Hasalashri Hariyangi the Kuntu Vandi Subudadi Ali Gananatana Sandi Hasalashri Hariyangi the Kuntu Vandi Subudadi Ali Gananatana 
ಹಿಂದೆ ರಾವಣ ತಾನು ಒಂದಿಸದೆ ಗಜ ಮುಖನ ಹಿಂದೆ ರಾವಣ ತಾನು ಒಂದಿಸದೆ ಗಜ ಮುಖನ ನಿಂದು ತಪವನು ಗೈದು ವರ ಪಡೆಯಲು ನಿಂದು ತಪವನು ಗೈದು ವರ ಪಡೆಯಲು ಒಂದು ನಿಮಿಷದಿ ಬಂದು ವಿಘ್ನವನ್ನು ಆಚರಿಸಿ ತಂದ ವರಗಳನ್ನೆಲ್ಲದರೆಗೆ ನಿಲ್ಲಿಸಿದನು ವಂದಿಸುವುದಾದಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಗಣನಾಥನ ಒಂದು ನಿಮಿಷದಿ ಬಂದು ವಿಘ್ನವನ್ನು ಆಚರಿಸಿ ತಂದ ವರಗಳನ್ನೆಲ್ಲದರೆಗೆ ನಿಲ್ಲಿಸಿದನು ವಂದಿಸುವುದಾದಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಗಣನಾಥನ ಸಂದೇಹ ಸಲ್ಲ ಶ್ರೀ ಹರಿಯಾಗಿ ಇದ ಕುಂಟು ವಂದಿಸುವುದಾದಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಗಣನಾಥನ ಇಂದು ಜಗವೆಲ್ಲವೂ ಮೆನಂದನನ ಪೂಜಿಸಲು ಚಂದದಿಂದಲಿ ಸಕಲ ಸಿದ್ಧಿಗಳನ್ನಿಟ್ಟು ಇಂದು ಜಗವೆಲ್ಲವೂ ಮೆನಂದನನ ಪೂಜಿಸಲು ಚಂದದಿಂದಲಿ ಸಕಲ ಸಿದ್ಧಿಗಳನ್ನಿಟ್ಟು ತಂದೆ ಶ್ರೀ ಪುರಂದರ ವಿಠಲನ ಸೇವೆಯೊಳು ಬಂತ ವಿಘ್ನವ ಕಳೆದು ಆನಂದವನು ಕೊಡುವ ವಂದಿಸುವುದಾದಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಗಣನಾಥನ ತಂದೆ ಶ್ರೀ ಪುರಂದರ ವಿಠಲನ ಸೇವೆಯೊಳು ಬಂದ ವಿಘ್ನವ ಕಳೆದು ಆನಂದವನು ಕೊಡುವ ವಂದಿಸುವುದಾದಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಗಣನಾಥನ ಸಂದೇಹ ಸಲ್ಲ ಶ್ರೀ ಹರಿಯ ಗೇದ ಕುಂಟು ವಂದಿಸುವುದಾದಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಗಣನಾಥನ 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 thank you ananya for such melodious uh, song as well as invocation song uh, so with this uh, we'll go to the next uh, agenda that is lighting of lamp so i request the student volunteers to help uh, in lighting of lamp and the dignitaries on the dais please join us for lighting the lamp with the blessings of lord ganesha and also lighting the lamp i guess we are good to go to start the event so i'll be the host for the symposium today i'm dr abhishek apaji associate professor at bms college of engineering as well as treasurer of ieee bangalore section uh, so the first thing what we have uh, in our plate is uh, inaugural address by shri bs bindu madhava who is scientist g and senior director at seed ag center uh, for development of advanced computing bangalore yeah so before that uh, we have uh, welcome address uh, before we go for the talk we have welcome address 
So the welcome address will be given by Dr. Rinki Sharma, who is uh, Associate Professor at uh, Ramaya University of Applied Sciences. Ma'am, please. A very good morning to one and all present here. I'm Dr. Rinki Sharma from the Ramaya University of Applied Sciences, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all for the AI Symposium, followed by the hackathon Go AI, Go AI for Social Good, jointly organized by the IEEE Bangalore section and CDAC Bangalore. I welcome the dignitaries on the dais, Sri Bindu Madhava, Dr. Prashant Mishra, Dr. Naveen, Ms. Divya, Dr. Dinesh will be joining us soon. I also welcome Dr. S.D. Sudarshan, Executive Director of CDAC Bangalore, and Dr. Deepa Shunoi, Chair IEEE Bangalore section. We really miss their physical presence. I welcome the speakers of the symposium who have agreed to be a part of the symposium and share their knowledge with us in spite of their busy schedules. I welcome the enthusiastic students who have joined us offline and in person to listen to and learn from the distinguished speakers. It is my pleasure to welcome the mentors who have joined the students from their respective institutes as well as the mentors who have volunteered to mentor the students from the committee. Organizing this event, organizing an event of this scale requires months of discussion, planning, and execution. I welcome all the organizing committee members who have worked tirelessly to put this event together. I welcome all those who have directly or indirectly helped in organizing this event. Thank you. Thank you very much, very much ma'am. Yes, as definitely said by Rinki ma'am, we are missing our chair of ITP Bangalore section, Dr. Deepa Shanai, but she has given our best wishes for the event and she's traveling, she couldn't come. So with this, we'll go for our first inaugural address by uh, Sri uh, Bindu Madhava sir who is Scientist G and Senior Director at the Center for Development of Advanced Computing, a national R&D lab. Yeah. I'll just give a little bit brief introduction about sir. Uh, he heads the real-time system and critical infrastructure security activities. He has around 34 years of industry and information technology experience. Obtained his bachelor degree in electrical and electronics engineering from Bangalore University, postgraduate diploma in systems management from NAIT, and MS in electronics and control system from Bits Pilani. His current research interests are in network and internet security, real time systems, agent computing, smart grid, self management, managing system software, and cyber physical system. He has filed three patents, author 65 uh, three international and national conference papers. Currently, is fellow of IE, I, I, Institute of Engineers and fellow of IETE, senior member of IEEE Bangalore section and immediate past chair of IEEE Bangalore section. A lot of things to read, but we have the man in front of us, so the stage is yours. Morning. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I wear two hats. So on behalf of uh, both hats, I would like to welcome the others other than CDAC people who are IEEEans and who are not members, non ians So welcome to all of you for this particular event, AI for social good. I'll try to sort of uh, Tell my journey with this subject, which is always uh, uh, the thing, like I keep on telling in all my latest talks, it starts with IoT, with uh, Ganesha, and ends with AI. Mangala, right? You see any conference, any technical talk, any fellow of whatever the stature, they utter these words. So if they don't start with IoT, is illiterate. That's what I 
uh, these days people are thinking and if they don't end with ai okay so he is not a literate of uh, computers okay but there is no big deal of this particular thing but the only thing is we might have to sort of see how best we can use the tool whatever so called ai for social good so what i thought is uh, i thought uh, first of all let me congratulate uh, ieee bangalore section and all the societies supporting this particular uh, uh, symposium and uh, followed with hackathon uh, this is very apt for the current days and a lighter note i was mentioning uh, uh, these earlier but uh, uh, on all levels i think uh, this is a very apt subject and uh, it is a apt domain right so i would like to sort of congratulate uh, all the uh, people who are taken pains from ieee and of course heavily supported by our cdac so with this particular thing i would like to sort of um, uh, start my talk on this particular subject so i got few slides for support but uh, i thought uh, most of the talking i will do right because the idea is what is there in stores because today there is something people are talking technologically certain things are progressing okay so the first slide what i would like to sort of address this in two parts one is ai as a tool and social good what is social and what is good right so what is the goodness and how do you measure that particular thing so the next slide okay a little bit background of this particular uh, uh, thing when it comes to social let's take the word social okay uh, the un uh, united nation general assembly on uh, the 70th session on 25th of september 2015 they came out with uh, a plan for millennium development goal right so this is a start point and these are all the sustainable development goals which has been set by the un okay and uh, they started implementing this from uh, 1st of january 2016 okay we are in 22 so there is already an uh, index which has been published by the uh, un where they have ranked, ranked all the countries okay so i'll tell what is the number of india so we'll be sort of astonished to see and this is measured on 169 targets pointers right so that's how the thing is so now we'll just see what are the sdgs on which we sort of play around and what are the targets which are there so no poverty zero hunger so it's all there in front right so most of the uh, things have been picked up from here and the technologies are being used for this and there is a measurement index which has been taken so that's how it is seen so ai happens to be a tool for sort of implementing this and also measuring the outcomes of uh, these uh, sdgs so i think these are self explanatory which is available in google for uh, sdgs you should be able to get so there is no big deal in this particular thing right okay we'll go to the next slide okay so these are uh, the 17 uh, things which are there and uh, selectively people uh, select whatever the sdg is required and apply uh, any tool and try to measure that and uh, submit okay that's how the whole thing is there now these uh, 17 there are the dimensions three dimensions uh, of this uh, development sustainable goals so what are what are these three dimensions one is social the other one is economic and the other one is environment right so these are the three dimensions that is why this so called social is there and good is attached to that so that's how the whole uh, theme of this particular symposium is there now uh, when it comes to the ranking of india it is 120 having 165 participants we are in the 120th position so we are safely in more than 100 right 
So that might be because of the population and uh, these SDGs, wherever applied, there are a lot of barriers for that to sort of become a success. So that is why the number of India is 120 out of 165. This is the report which is there around 2021. So 2022 report is yet to come. Now, uh, the other thing is, uh, all these things, SDGs has to be currently contexted or recasted with the background of so-called new normal, right? So all these things, uh, there'll be a paradigm shift uh, with the new normal, whatever the definition is. So before COVID, during COVID and after COVID, all these scenarios, we might have to recast this and see where do we stand. The other pointer, what I just wanted to give us, uh, the Niti Aayog has come out with a report for, for uh, which is called as AI for all. So they have included everybody. But uh, that particular thing, again, the AI is for all, but focus area is mostly on the health, environment, agriculture. So some five areas are there, again, uh, which they are trying to concentrate. Now, all these things, based on the numbers, the indexes will be calculated. There is a ministry called as Ministry of uh, Statistics and Program Implementation, which has categorized this SDGs into six sub-categories, where they have grouped poverty, agriculture, and food security, labor and employment and education, health and gender-related issues. Environment and climate change versus good governance and capacity building. Of course, using all these tools, so-called big data, blockchain, AI, and uh, machine learning. So this is how the category has been categorized. So now the social aspect is that. So now I will come to the AI. AI happens to be a subcomponent of something which is there big to come. Okay, what is that big to come and how it has been derived? We'll just see in the next uh, few slides. This is uh, the thing which will be talked of. Okay, so if you see, I think a combination of uh, this industry, whatever 1.02, wherever 5.0, what I have put is industry 5.0 plus plus because already six is under discussion. So we are yet to sort of uh, discuss only industry 4.0 with a combination of another buzzword which is uh, very loosely used is quantum okay so that's how the thing is the classical computing infrastructure shifting on to a space of quantum is what people are trying to sort of take as a lead so the, the idea of putting this slide is if you see the last one industry 5.0 that is where the cognitive systems people are talking right so now I'm trying to connect AI to the cognitive systems because overall AI happens to be a subcomponent of the cognitive system by large. So that is why I just uh, picked up this particular slide to say that it's a cyber physical system which is cognitive in nature. So that is the uh, idea of having this particular thing. Now there were uh, 10 SDGs and uh, implementation wise, uh, uh, domain wise, whatever the things, there are some grouping which has been done by the World Bank. Okay, we'll see what are the grouping of the 10 SDGs where we can group functionally and take it forward. I think the next few slides will be talking of uh, the definitions of certain things to put in place. Okay, so these are terminologies which are used. Cognitive, again, if you see artificial intelligence, if you see on the right hand side, these are all some of the basic things which has to be put in place. And uh, is artificial intelligence a subset of cognitive thing? Yes and no. So because there are some overlaps between these two. But uh, basically we have to cover all those things which are there on the right hand side. Uh, the dictionaries, uh, lexicons, ontology and uh, natural language processing and other things, right? Now, when it comes to another terminology always used uh, is uh, AI with machine learning, right? 
they go hand in hand so what is that machine learning is it a, a sort of uh, how is it different from the pattern recognition which people are were talking earlier so i'll just um, in the next few slides say what is the age of this technology is what we are talking and currently trying to debate so when did it start okay but we are talking about that thing now how is it, uh, is it relevant or not so relevant so these are some of the two waves uh, which has to be there because uh, if you see all of a sudden from 2015 onwards there is a lot of emphasis on the second aspect uh, which is the machine centric uh, digitization because people centric uh, thing was already uh, on and off so if you see the big automation industries uh, where the process automation and the office automation a combination was being uh, discussed so if you see the people centric and uh, machine centric on the top you'll see the infrastructure right so the infrastructures which were there starting from mainframe today we talk about uh, might be planet computing because uh, cloud is already spoken too much i think uh, there is a another uh, buzzword which has been coined and which has been used is the planet computing so if you see on that uh, access and the 2015 happens to be a important uh, a place where uh, the classical computing and the infrastructures which were uh, supposed to be looked at what are the driving uh, factors right so if you see the driving factors uh, we were talking about automation which was uh, enterprise wise then subsequently we felt that there should be some something for the citizen that's how we had lot of uh, g2c b2d and all sort of combination what is available for the consumer or the citizen now we are talking about uh, the digitization and uh, which is a combination of uh, the hard sensor which is a embedded system or as a sensor and uh, social networks which gives the soft sensing uh, components the data so these two if you see uh, as far as cdac is concerned because i represent cdac so cdac is concerned we operate in all these ways from left to right completely right now uh, this cognitive computing was the thing which was started in 2015 and that is uh, how it has been connected and uh, if you see the programming uh, paradigms uh, it is almost going towards uh, the uh, cognitive uh, computing space using adaptive interactive and whatever the parameters which has to be looked at so this is a slide which is uh, from ibm now what are the drivers there should be some drivers for this particular thing so for the classical computing uh, space uh, most law becomes the uh, driver where uh, we should do something different than the classical computing because uh, there are uh, the main parameters of debate is the power the power consumption power dissipation right so that's why people are trying to sort of move into another space where we can achieve equal or almost superior than the classical computing of the day using some other technology that is what is so called quantum so the big data which is a buzzword which was there for last 5 uh, 6 years now of course it has gone into back end but it became it has become an essential factor now right the other thing is the internet is always there so you attach anything to that any device so you call as internet of everything today so that's how the thing has been built and take it on to a cloud so that uh, you don't own any infrastructure the next thing is the new algorithms for the machine learning uh, which is uh, basically uh, trying to sort of see how to improve the performance and the accuracy of uh, any application these are some of the drivers which are going closer to the cognitive uh, space and uh, indirectly even artificial intelligence is to look this uh, into this parameter so the age of uh, these uh, so called uh, things what we are talking 1950 artificial intelligence right so we are in 2022 72 years so 
of course uh, that we'll see what was the artificial intelligence at that time and what is the artificial intelligence this i mean today what we are talking about machine learning 1980 and the deep learning there is another uh, thing which has been uh, deep learning 2010 one more box has to be added to this which uh, prashant will be talking is the reinforcement learning 2015 so these are the ages of the technologies what we are going to sort of see but the challenge there are challenges for the application that is why we are sort of so much backward in the implementation of this technology okay the challenge is how the application drives this particular thing so there are two aspects what is happening is the academics always try to sort of drive with the yeah capabilities and look for a social problem which will never fit in so the uh, industry will try to sort of look in the other way they will try to see pick up an application and try to drive the technology into that so that also will go some way because there is lot of barriers and restrictions for implementation of the technologies into the space what is looked at now uh, AI. Always we were talking. There is another uh, thing called as weak AI and strong AI. So that is another uh, thing, right? So there is. It was weak in 1950. Now might be it is becoming stronger. But uh, what is making it stronger is all this allied basic uh, fundamental things which are coming into this. So the degree of cognition or degree of autonomous autonomous is the thing which is trying trying to make it as as strong as possible so the effective computing is another paradigm which is there so this is basically the sensing component and other things which come into the picture the process sensing everything into the thing an example is uh, at cdac we have got something called as enos and e tang so enos basically smells the uh, aroma and uh, classify certain thing e tang based on the taste so as far as cdac is concerned this particular product is used in tea gardens basically where uh, the tea tasters thing becomes important so if you see that uh, all these things are the basic components which form the part and parcel of the cognitive computing and a subset of artificial intelligence so these are some of the use cases i think uh, everybody knows this today we are talking about gaming so yesterday we were talking about botnet right tomorrow will of course uh, robotics is uh, a thing which is we are talking for a very long time and recommender systems is another thing which is of uh, very use thing so this this slide i just wanted to sort of, uh, that is why i told is a uh, famous cognitive or is it a subset so if you see there are two sets and uh, there is uh, something which is overlapping so ai is mostly based on the algorithmic uh, thing cognition is mostly on the smart or intelligent aspects which will be looked at so these are some of the uh, branches of uh, the things which are looked at computer science always looks at programming artificial intelligence and machine learning of course we are looking for the algorithm statistics always will be there statistics and mathematics and probability which looks for ma math and of course there is a knowledge domain also there was uh, there is a lot of things which is spoken even cdac the center where we are seeing is something called as uh, knowledge uh, computing which was there earlier it was kbcs it was called okay so that's how i just wanted to connect the technologies with cdac whatever we is doing little bit of marketing to cdac and uh, then subsequently uh, the technologies which are already put into use now coming back to the sdgs right these things uh, the world bank has categorized into the 10 major uh, uh, things so the i think uh, any of the social problem falls into this sector so if you see the crisis response it's nothing but disaster management management systems which are there the other one is the economic empowerment so it covers uh, all those areas education 
environment, equality and inclusion, health and hunger, information verification and validation, and infrastructure. I think uh, that is what Prashant is trying to sort of uh, get connected to the space. And uh, then subsequently, public and social uh, sector, security and justice. So these are some of uh, some of the ten categories. All that seventeen SDGs has been mapped onto this. Now the tool, whatever or the technology, what you have in space, has to match this to get the best out of this and see there is a ma major impactful uh, uh, services which can be delivered. Okay, so. Now, not only that, uh, there are other things which has to be looked at, right? So when you see the artificial intelligence, what are the basic building blocks for that particular thing? Because there are uh, things which has been used, uh, but there should be some basic uh, capabilities. So these are some of the things, right? Computer vision, speech, audio processing, natural language processing, content generation, reinforcement learning, deep learning on structured data. So these are uh, some of the basic building blocks, which can be directly mapped onto that uh, areas of the World Bank, which has been categorized, and that indirectly will be supporting the uh, SDGs, right? That's how uh, the whole uh, transition takes place. So any problem should be looked into this uh, space, and you should be able to apply the whatever AI today and cognitive tomorrow and uh, People are talking about so many other technologies. But you should uh, see that this is a uh, thing. The problem should be first, and then subsequently use the technology which is happening and which gets the major uh, benefit out of it. So I just wanted to conclude. What I did is these and World Bank, uh, whatever the there, and the technologies which can be used, and what is the current trends which are there, and what is the future in this particular area. Just to conclude, so any climate change uh, will call for a disaster. So you have to do a disaster management. And any disaster will have a health hazard. The other thing is uh, the sustainable goal, uh, development goals are on five Ps, right? We are very good at uh, coining some words, right? So there are five Ps here. So it is people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership. These are the five Ps which will help into sort of uh, uh, achieve whatever the uh, metrics is, what is required for measurement. So here, uh, based on uh, the periodicity of usage of uh, the AI and uh, other things, there are uh, different things which can be picked up, and there are a lot of uh, impactful programs which are there. That is why. Uh, there are countries uh, be, before us, uh, around 119 countries which are there, who are before us, who has been successfully implemented only because of the size. The other problem is uh, the even societal problems can be solved uh, using just not AI, some optimization and network analysis also. So there are problems which use uh, good yield by doing this particular model. So I thought uh, it was an inaugural address, so let me have. Uh, gamut of the whole thing uh, covered so that uh, whoever wants whatever the problem can be picked up and whatever the technology of the day can be sort of used. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers from IEEE for giving me this opportunity to be here and uh, trying to give my thought process. Thank you. Thank you very much, for, sir, for, for wonderful insight about AI for social good with a lot of wonderful examples. Now I request Professor Balakrishna, who is part of our organizing committee, please to please hand over a moment or two, sir. Thank you, sir. So next we'll go to the uh, uh, before we go to the next talk, we have Dr. Krishnamala, Associate Professor from Dhyanand Sagar University, who will be giving us the event overview. Good morning, everyone. 
symposium followed by hackathon so as uh, dr abhishek has told it was a long time plan we have taken to host this event so cdac we thank cdac for giving vitally bangalore section the opportunity to host this event at cdac so i bangalore section and good this artificial intelligence symposium followed by hackathon go for social good the symposium is fully oriented towards ai ml and deep learning with speakers across academia and industry the latest developments and future ai applications will be presented with open discussions from eminent we have with us dr prashant mishra senior scientist tcs who will be speaking on electric vehicles we have with us dr sd sudarshan who will be joining us online executive director cdac who will be speaking on ai for cyber security and followed by sudarshan we will be having dr dinesh babu from triple it bangalore who will be speaking for, about ai for interviewing then we have with us dr navin who will be for prototyping and product development the exciting part of this is the this hackathon will enable innovative young minds to solve intellectual problem tasks by taking or applying ai skills for decision making and adopting supervised and unsupervised models and this is done by both ug and pg students across the india now for the symposium we had a total of 150 registrations out of which we have around 140 in the hall and some of them have also joined online on our bridge for the hackathon we had totally 43 uh, proposals dr navin and the team uh, had a hard job shortlisting the proposals for the hackathon out of 43 proposals which we had received we shortlisted around 35 proposals out of 35 proposals 26 proposals have registered for the hackathon some of them could not res, uh, register mostly due to exams and other schedules packed up schedules now again ipc bangalore section and cdac have collaborated to provide this platform to all the young minds to build creative solutions to leverage the power of ai for social cause we are trying to nurture your young minds with mentors from both your institution as well as from industry we have mentors from cdac and also from other universities participants participants would be having an opportunity and hands on experience in using national supercomputing missions super computer param utkarsh and this param utkarsh is built by cdac and this is deployed in cdac so after the inaugural address i mean after the symposium there will be an overview about uh, param utkarsh you can adopt param utkarsh in your hackathon problems and try to solve it and again after the talk there will be an a uh, brief overview about the hackathon and the steps that has to be followed during the hackathon process each hackathon team will be having two mentors one will be our internal mentor which is the college mentor the other mentor is the external mentor both the mentors will be having equal roles in mentoring you you can discuss your issues with your mentor and if you are having any issues at the venue regarding the internet or the technical requirements you can reach out to us we'll try to arrange it for you. coming for mentors mentor call was announced pulled from both industry and academia and we have also done an orientation program for the mentors so that mentoring can be done finally we have the evaluation panel each team is associated with an evaluation panel the jury may come to your panel any time during your hackathon during the 24 hours of your hackathon which will be a first level of jury and then shortlisted teams will be called for the final level of jury 
you can ensure that you have your uh, presentation slide decks and your models ready and coming to the organizing committee we had with us uh, dr sudarshan from cdac and dr deepa shenoy from icit bangalore section dr alokna dev from samson dr navin from amrita dr janaki from cdac and we had uh, ms divya who is the who is the core member of this event then the uh, in the operational committee we had dr abhishek deshmukh from kelly gopta institute who who gave us who who helped us in designing the uh, hackathon mentors and other rubrics then we have dr abhishek apaji who has been in hosting the event we have ashwini apaji we have with us changappa who is handling the online event dr kumudini ravindra who is uh, we chair women in engineering iit bangalore section co chair who is also one of the sponsors for the event we have parmeshwar chari g triple s iit and mysu sub section chair we have purlalata ji from uh, manipal institute of technology bangalore sub section chair prashant dr prashant mishra from tcs you'll hear from him later we have dr rajshekar from ps society dr mr we have dr rinki sharma from ms ramaya satish kalidas shrikant tangade from christ university vijay lakshmi from bms vinay jordan from mit and raghavendra prasad who is the sac chair so i thank all the operational committees for making this event success thank you for giving us the insight about the entire event of the two days uh, so next we have uh, we'll start with the symposium after a wonderful inaugural address we have a second talk by dr prashant mishra who is the vice chair and senior vice chair of itp bangalore section and senior scientist with tcs research where he works on intelligent cyber physical systems for smart mobility he received his phd in computer science and engineering from university of south wales sydney australia and completed his postdoc from swedish institute of computer science stockholm he has worked in different roles and capabilities for keen csiro australia robert bosch center for cyber physical, physical systems at iic bangalore he has published over 50 plus uh, peer reviewed articles in premier systems uh, uh, research forums and art journals he has received several recognitions for his work of which noteworthy to mention here are MIT uh, top 10 innovators under the age of in India, ERCIM, uh, Alay Bolson, and Mary Curie Fellowship in 2012, Australian Government Aussie Australian Leadership Award, and so on. He serves on editorial board of ITP Communications magazine as series editor of uh, Internet of Things. There are. He's founding chair of uh, I Mobile ACM chapter. Yeah, chapter of ACM Sig Mobile Technical Subcommittee, Prime Member of Executive Committee of Bangalore Section as Vice Chair, as mentioned, and I T P Bangalore. To Prashant, uh, electric vehicle routing with vehicles to grid supply using reinforcement learning. hello okay great so good morning everyone so i'll be talking about uh, 
topic what I call as electric vehicle routing. Um, so essentially it is to do with electric vehicles but I will focus on a very specific segment of the EV which is called as routing of vehicles. Okay. And I will try to probably show you how we use some uh, very interesting techniques to come up with this route compared to traditional techniques. So there were some problems by using traditional techniques and we have found some better algorithms to actually do those things. Is this better? Okay. Now I, I think uh, again uh, uh, the point I want to drive here, here is that it is not a uh, even so if the, this is a problem that you will associate really well because I am sure a lot of you buy uh, the Amazon, a lot of deliveries come to Amazon through the Flipkart. So a lot of delivery boys come to you at the doorstep and deliver goods, right? I will probably take you uh, to the stage gates as to how they, how the delivery happens and probably focus on the last mile part of it where we can actually use these electric vehicles to actually minimize the cost of the operation. But then we also come up with a very interesting concept of what we call as vehicle to grid supply. And I'll tell you why exactly we talk about that because uh, seems like there is some value in trying to merge uh, delivery with this type of service so that the overall cost of operations can be uh, minimized. So I'll probably talk about this but somehow wrap it uh, uh, within this framework of routing and how do I do routing using some very new techniques that typically a lot of this learning based control uh, paradigms allow us to do. Okay. Now, Now the motivation of the problem is that I think, I think the first statement is the most important part. Now when you look about, uh, look at last mile delivery, that is the delivery, so let's say you order a good online on Amazon, okay, and let's say that item is sent from Delhi uh, to your home in Bangalore. So the way it happens is that somebody, uh, the seller ships it from Delhi, it travels all the way through flight to Bangalore, comes to a distribution center in Bangalore and from there it is loaded onto this uh, small little uh, four wheelers, three wheelers and then distributed to your home, right. So that leg of the journey from that distribution center to your home is the last mile leg, okay. And uh, and that is the most interesting part because that is the most loss making sector. Uh, around six, uh, So if you look at the, the entire uh, logistics process right from where the goods originate till it comes to your home, 50 to 60 percent of the cost is in the last mile itself. And that is, that is what actually brings out the entire operation cost of the segment, it grows as the operation cost of the segment. And one of the very interesting part is that a lot of the delivery trucks that come to your home from an operations point of view, if I am running such operations, 40% um, of my capacity of my, my, my delivery vans are unused, which means that I am not able to properly size my delivery in such a way that I am actually fill up the entire truck and increase my utilization of vehicles. So all of these factors lead to loss of revenue. So you can imagine, I am basically, I do have a truck that can accommodate 100 parcels, but rather than accommodate 100 parcels, I can just accommodate 50 parcels, even though there is space for another 40. Okay, which means that I am not able to properly utilize my, my, my vehicle which is actually sized to deliver 100 and top of that the, the all the different nuances of the last mile add to the woos of the last mile that brings the operating cost that keeps the operating cost of the segment. Okay. Now, uh, now uh, if you look at logistic companies, they are trying different ways to solve that. A lot of technical ways have been used especially to uh, improve the, op uh, the operational efficiency of that part. Uh, EVs are also in thought. Why EVs are in concern for the segment? Because EVs due to the fact that the maintenance costs are low and there are a lot of incentives in actually in buying EVs. Uh, uh, EVs turn out to be a more, EVs turn out to be a more, uh, uh, what's the economical in terms of the business cases that is coming up. And that's why you will see the Flipkart, the Amazons have actually committed to transform the last mile into electric vehicles, okay. Now what we are, uh, uh, but uh, what we believe is that I think even if you use EVs, we are not still fully utilizing the potential of electric vehicles. Now the most interesting part here is that, of course you, you use your vehicle, you will go and deliver both your uh, packages, but what, what is interesting is the battery of the vehicle, okay. Now what we are saying is that see, because you are actually uh, not able to, uh, what do you say, uh, because there is a revenue loss uh, due to uh, uh, unfilled space in your delivery van, can you complement that loss by engaging in some other service? And what is the other service we are talking of over here? We are talking of, see anyways you have batteries, can you actually find an opportunity while you are delivering goods to actually sell this power back to the grid? Okay, because the grid will then pay you back. So we have this option model where in grid we actually buy a power from the grid, but we have this new, new operation model where you can actually also sell power back to the grid. Okay, and the mechanisms are there. It very heavily, the, the, the two-way bi-directional mechanism is already present in Europe. I think in India also these things will come up shortly, but it is possible. Technically, it is now possible. 
and they are good models wherein not only can you buy from the grid but also you can sell back the grid. Okay. Now, if you look at it, both these problems of how to deliver goods is been spoken or solved in a silo. How you deliver uh, power back to grid is again a problem that is talked in silo. What we have done uniquely here is, is that we are saying that in the process of delivering goods to your customers, can you find opportunity within that process to also sell power back to grid? We are not looking at these two problems separately. But we have somehow combined the problem of delivery as delivery of goods to customers and delivery of good energy to the grid. So think of it that way. It's basically think of a delivery process. You have a package that you want to deliver to a person, and you have a package of energy that you want to deliver back to the grid. So it's a delivery at the end of the day, but you are delivering two different items. At one, you are delivering boxes, at the other end, you are delivering power. Okay. Now, so this is the this is the multi-service delivery model we are we are uh, trying to talk about here, saying that. And the model is that it is mandatory that you need to deliver packages to customers because that's the KPI for any delivery company. Right? But if there is an opportunity, can you optionally find an opportunity to actually again sell power back to the grid? And if you can do that, whatever revenue loss is due to not being able to size your delivery ramps to maximum capacity, can be augmented by selling power back to the grid. Is the business proposition clear? Right. So uh, see, uh, I'll give you a very crude example. I think once I was driving uh, back home, and I think it was around. Uh, I'd gone to a temple. Actually, I was driving back home. It was probably around eight in the morning. Okay, and I saw uh, an Uber. Okay, uh, not a, uh, basically a, a radio taxi service. Okay, this driver, he was parked in the side of the road, and he had his hatch open. Okay, and he was actually selling coconuts. Okay, so he's a very smart man. So he knows that not that period where you will get good booking. So actually sells coconuts at this point of time. And when booking factory start rising, he closes shop because it's just his hatchback and goes on on the alert system. So think of how innovative the people are. So if you look at this model, this again of the kind wherein we are not doing either or or we are trying to do both, where but finding an optimum moment for doing that. Okay. Now uh, I'll talk about the, what the technical challenges of this problem problem here. Eleven, right? Where do I end? 1045. Yeah, I'll give the sense of the problem. Yeah, yeah, I'll give the sense. So I think the biggest challenge in this problem is that these are problems what we call a spatio-temporal problem, space-time problem. Okay. Why is it a space-time problem? Okay. So look at this graph. Okay. So essentially, if you look at this graph, this is where your depot is. This is where all the delivery vans have to originate from. Okay. And all these yellow nodes are your customer locations where you have to deliver. Goods and all your green nodes are where you have to deliver or sell energy, and you actually have to find a route to them. Now it is a space-time problem because look at this side of it. So essentially, there is a demand axis. Demand axis is that you have to deliver goods to customers, and then supply is the electric vehicle itself. Okay, and your vehicle. So essentially, the demand exists in different uh, uh, different places. So look at the city. So essentially. Uh, I have to deliver uh, goods in probably, you know, in the city center, I have to deliver goods in somewhere in Pira campus, some other campus. So, my customers are all distributed in the city. And also, the delivery, and they also have delivery time preferences. It's not like whenever you stop the door, they will take it. They will say that, okay, you can deliver to me between 12 to 2 p.m. You can, of course, set this preference as well. I'm not available at home in this period of time to deliver you after that time. So, it's a space and time problem, okay? Similarly, energy is also a space time problem because it's not like whenever you have time, you push power to the grid and it take it. Grid will only buy power from you when it needs it. Okay. Again, grid locations, wherever. So essentially, you need the discharging stations from where you can push power back to the grid. And again, the discharging stations also spread around the city, and they will be able to accept power from you only when the grid requires it. So again, there's a space and time uh, variable to do it. So you think of it. There are two commodities. One is goods. One is energy. And the supply is the same vehicle. And this vehicle is also moving. So essentially, the supply is moving. And your demand is moving. Okay. And you have to find a routine, a route that is able to match the demand and supply in space and time and in real time. So that's the problem here. Okay, it's a very difficult problem. Now, second uh, point I want to highlight here is that uh, this class of problems belongs to what is what we call a vehicle routing problem. So this is a very old field, 50 years old field. People have tried a number of ways to solve it. Okay. And uh, and typically, what all algorithms that you see these days, or what the Amazon Flipkart use, are all uh, well uh, researched. They work. Now, 
the biggest problem with this gary problems is that it belong the class of problems what called np hard so you can solve this problem for a very small data set okay very small so let's say you have just 10 customers or 15 customers you can very nicely solve it in the most optimal manner but if you have like 100 customers 1000 customers these algorithms don't scale well that's the second challenge third is that uh, you uh, uh, third is that as a because the np hard problems if you have too much muscle power you may probably throw as much muscle power and compute power and go and solve the problem but it will not uh, it will not give a solution as the scale of system rises and even if it gives a solution it will take a very long time probably a month to give a solution with that cyber compute power okay so you don't have a we do you don't have algorithms that can solve this problem very quickly okay so these are so essentially the first problem challenges because of the fact that we are trying to solve the space time problem the second two problems are because of the fact that the computation is very very hard problem so uh, the approach that we are taken here is that we are trying to solve this vehicle routing problem using this method of reinforcement learning that is learning to control okay or in my case is learning to decide to learn optimal routing policies in a system that is multi service oriented okay so recall our operation model is a multi service option model we want to sell goods and energy and we want to find good routing policies and the way i want to find routing policies is that i want to use mechanism of learning to decide and with that i want to come up with the route okay so as you can see there's a lot of things that we have put done behind it we have tried to model this problem first so there's there's a very nice uh, uh, system model for it where we depict this problem as a graph network okay uh, we have a very nice optimization problem so just to uh, spend uh, one minute on this if you look at the object the, the way we would like to minimize the cost of the operation is that one way is that you, you can minimize the distance that the vehicles travel in that way you can minimize the cost of the trip second factor is that if you send less number of vehicles in the depot okay rather than sending 10 vehicles you send eight vehicles that will also minimize the cost of the trip third part is that if you actually spend more time selling energy back to the grid okay that is how you will maximize you will maximize the revenue that you earn and minimize the corporate cost so essentially the object of the system is to find a policy that is able to uh, minimize distance minimize number of vehicles while this is the next is a while maximize the service time in selling power back to this so what we have done is that we formulated that a very nice operation problem we have defined multiple constraints to it uh, but finally i think we couldn't solve the problem beyond 15 uh, uh, 15 nodes okay and the problem doesn't scale beyond that so we had this approach of we casted that standard operation problem into what we call as the rl uh, framework design and there are a lot of things that we have done. I don't have time to explain. They're very interesting, but I don't have time to explain these things to you now. Uh, so we have this, so to represent that problem, we designed what we call as the. So we have to we have to convert that problem of what we call as the Markov decision process. And if you want to convert that in the Markov decision process, you have to define the states of the system, you have to define the action of the system, and then you have to define the reward of the system. So just to give you a brief as to how these RLs work, so it's more like how you how a, how you teach in class essentially. Let's say you ask a student. Uh, an answer to a question. So it gives the correct answer to give the star. So that's a positive reinforcement. While if this student is not able to give the correct answer, you, um, you probably don't give a star. So that's a negative reinforcement. So the system actually learns that way. So if basically, so essentially the state is nothing but the current uh, context of the system, where exactly in space and time the system stands. Okay. And I will take an action based on logic that I have designed. And what the system and what the system does is that it gives me a reward out. Given that I am this current state, given that I am standing in this location, okay, and I want to probably walk walk to the cameraman, okay. If I take this route, which basically on a tangent route, the system will give me a negative reward, okay. Whereas I am standing here and I'm actually walking towards this cameraman, it's actually a line of credit, but give me a positive reward. That's how the system starts learning and controlling for yourself, okay. And actually, it scales really well. It works very fast actually. But there's a lot of, uh, so again, the algorithm that we designed is not a traditional, a traditional way of learning. There are a lot of tricks that we have, uh, uh, that we use in there, probably a, a, a time for a longer discussion here. And again, I've tried to put a very simple example as to how the entire network works. Again, uh, I don't have time for that. Um, but to tell you some very neat results around it. So I'll show you one plot of the training, okay. So one of the measures, to see if your system is really working well is what we call what we measure the fulfillment ratio. So fulfillment ratio means that let's say you have uh, 50 parcels that you have to deliver, and you deliver all 50 parcels, fulfillment ratio is 100%. But if you deliver 40 40 parcels out of 50 parcels, 
pressurization is the speed pressure. Okay. So ideally, when you are doing a delivery process, your throughput ratio has to be one. Otherwise, you are not doing a good job. So if you look at it, the way the system is learning, so this is the reward signal. The blue is the reward signal. Okay. That system is getting. Okay. And if you see the way the system is training itself. Uh, uh, initially, when the system starts training, the uh, it gets a certain reward signal, and usually the fulfillment ratios are really low, around around 35 per 80 per. So it's not really learning really well. But after a certain number of training episodes, if you look at it, the fulfillment ratio actually touches one, and so does the reward, which means that the system has somehow gotten to know at what reward am I able to maximize the fulfillment ratio. So this is something, and the interesting part is that in nowhere have we actually keyed in this information to the system that you should maximize the fulfillment ratio. But the system is able to pick up with this simple pointers of positive rewards and negative rewards and able to learn that implicitly. And that's the real uh, power of the system that without giving a lot of these pointers explicitly, the system by simply even using positive rewards and negative reinforcement is able to derive that in a very implicit manner. Okay. Uh, I, I'll give you some very com simple, res some compared results here. No look at numbers. Okay, so what we have done is that to compare the performance of this RL algorithm. Uh, with the what we call as the the uh, MILT algorithm, okay. So MILT, so we had us uh, we we are trying to follow a data set that was 102 data set, okay. And MILT did not go beyond uh, 20 25 nodes, maybe or 15, I believe. So we have to come up with a meta heuristic approach. If we we use a genetic algorithm based meta heuristic approach to somehow make sure that we get some uh, results to benchmark against, okay. Now. And uh, and then when we did analysis, we found that the GA results are close to what the MILT results would have given. So we take that as the optimal baseline and we compare the RL cost. Now the interesting part is that the GA is better than RL on an average of 20 percent, which is known because RL and everything very approximate techniques. They are not accurate techniques. But look at the speed improvement. Execute time of RL, it is probably around 24 times faster than GA, and that's a big bump. Okay. So uh, so essentially, if you are if here's the trade-off. If you are if you are willing to sacrifice a bit of accuracy. Your speed improvement is really significant. Okay. And the next interesting part was that look at the optimality gap. Okay. So if you look at it, this is a, a data set uh, that has 25 nodes. This has 50 nodes. This is 100 nodes. If you look at the optimality gap, it is around 17%. That means basically what is how, what is the error? What is the deviance from the baseline? Okay. So it's around, so RL results are probably 18% worse off than the baseline. For the 50 node set, it is around 22%. And for the 100 nodes, around 20% off. Now, the very good thing from here is that as the system scale is going, the RL results are not getting worse, which normally they should. And that is the beauty of the system, which means that if we, if we have hook on this to the same trajectory, if the system tomorrow, because we are trying to solve a system that has 500 nodes, we would still expect the error to be hanging around that 20% mark. So, that is again a second beauty of the strength of the system. Again, uh, uh, there are a lot of details as to how we achieve that. I think if I was, if I was I was able to get time to explain the algorithm probably you had probably seen that but to leave with the message that here we are trying to solve our a vehicle routing problem using this multi-model uh, del delivery and it was a very hard problem computationally so what we have done here is that we have tried to imbibe a lot of the principles of uh, learning to decide or learning to control to actually come up with very nice routing policies that are that are probably 20 percent off than the optimum but give the immense speed improvement and that's the message I want to leave you with. Okay, so we, uh, we are still doing a lot of work around it, but I think, uh, and in fact, uh, just to tell you this, this work just got published. Uh, if you follow a lot of this AI conferences, so Amas is essentially uh, based on a multi conference again, a ESR conference in this field. We recently got this work accepted there, uh, and we got very good feedback. Of course, there are a lot of questions as to how the practical of model, but I think we are very sure that this vehicle to grid type of model, which is still not there but is coming, will. It is a valuable proposition add to the last mile delivery segment. And if you could do that, I think the, the, the loss that this last mile segment is making will be able to amortize that to some extent or probably a good extent. And if the fleet size is very large, so rather if let's say you as a delivery operator has just 50 vehicles versus a delivery operator that has 500 vehicles, I think the, the money that you make by selling energy back to grid will be much more magnanimous if your fleet size is larger. And so you can actually reduce the cost of the last mile operation. So with that, let me leave the finish a talk here. Uh, please, uh, I, I have the paper up on my website if you want to have a read of it. But there's a lot of work that can be done, and please uh, follow if you're interested in this kind of work. So, thank you. I was very fast, I had limited time, but I have a detailed discussion later on. Thank you. Yes, madam. <laughs>
Yes, yes. Yes. So what I do is that uh, I think uh, what we have done here is, uh, sorry. Yeah. So the people here on the bridge, I think what Sooji Madam was asking is that here our proposition is that if we sell power back to the grid, we will actually make money out of it. But we have not actually factored in the cost of actually charging my battery. Because you have a, so you need to spend money to charge your battery and to sell at a higher cost, then only make a profit. Otherwise, you really don't make a profit. That's the question that at what power price are you buying, uh, buying power to charge your battery and is it lower than what you sell at? Okay. So essentially, madam, that is accounted here in this, in this factor actually. So this factor actually is the cost of sending vehicles from the depot. So that factor, the cost of charging this vehicle. Okay. So we have taken that in account when we have formulated this problem. Okay. Yes. 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 So that's how the the current system is. Essentially, the model is that we charge a night when the price of electricity is low because later the prices pick up. Yeah. If you look at this actual demand supply uh, problem, actually, okay. Here your demand and demand is essentially want to uh, deliver goods to customers and deliver energy and supply into the vehicle. Okay, the demand supply matching problem. It's just that it's modeled or being worded in a different manner. Yes, yes, speak out to sell it back. Yes, yes. At that time, you are charging a vehicle or something, giving energy supply. It will take some, yes, some yes. time. At that situation, how will you handle? No, so essentially, uh, what's your name? So Raja is asking, saying that he want to probably uh, deliver goods to a customer, okay? And you have, and he wants the goods to be delivered to him between 12 noon and 2 p.m. But at that point, you are basically uh, happy sending power back to the grid. So you are not actually meeting the objective of actually delivering goods to a customer. How do you actually take care of that? Okay. So Raja, very true. This is what this entire optimization is all about. So this is what we call the multi-objective optimization problem. So there are two objectives. And there are these objectives are also competing objectives. First objective is that you want to deliver goods. Okay. The second objective is to deliver energy. Okay. And you don't want to deliver energy expense of delivering goods. So the operation problem that you see over there, the constraints in the operation problem actually take care of that. Okay. And there's a trade-off. It's not like, uh, as, as the title said, when it might be selling energy and that point that dem the demand may come to deliver goods. So it has to somehow cut short that part and go and deliver goods. And that could deliver. So essentially the entire operation form formulation that you saw as MILP along with constraints take care of the scenario. But again, it's a it's a multi-game system. Uh, and it, you have to come to a stable point somewhere. So wherein you make the left hand happy also and right hand happy and somehow come to a settlement point. And the operation does that basically. Yeah, uh, so due to paucity of time, we'll yeah. take a few more. I'm sure there are a lot of questions coming from the audience. And thank you, Prashant, for a wonderful talk. Very engaging talk, I would say, with thank a you. short time. So I request Chengappa to hand over a small moment of uh, CDAC as well as I think the bank Come, we'll take center stage. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you, Prashant. Prashant will be there with us for even longer time. So please catch hold of him during breaks and other uh, mentoring sessions and other times. So with this, uh, we'll break for uh, networking tea, uh, which is exactly beside the nice fountain, beautiful fountain, which is there, uh, where we got the registration done. So please take, uh, you know, you remember Zepto, which is in New York, 10 minutes. So that's the time you get for the break. Please go and come back within 10 minutes so that we have next session by our director of CDAC. Uh, Dr. Sudarshan, thank you. So we'll be back here by 11.10.
Hello, good morning, uh, Sudarshan here. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir. Good morning, sir. We can hear you very well. So thank you. Thank you very much, madam. Now, uh, sir, you just talk. You don't have any presentation, isn't it, sir? Good morning, sir. Sir, now it's tea break. People are gone there. One sec, come. I'll inform you, sir. Unmuted. Good morning, sir. Can you hear us? Sudarshan, sir. Yeah, we can hear him, I guess. I mean, hello, hello.
Sudarshan, sir, can you hear us? Yes, I can. I can hear you well. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah. I'm Abhishek here, sir. We'll start in like five minutes. We are waiting for the tea break to conclude. Yes, please. Thank you, sir. Welcome back, everyone. I request you to please settle down. After a couple of talks, uh, we have uh, next uh, one more talk that is AI for Cyber Security by Dr. S. D. Sudarshan, who is Executive Director, CDAC Bangalore. So, let me give a brief introduction of Dr. S. D. Sudarshan. Uh, he's the executive director at CDAC. He has over three decades of R&D experience as researcher and manager. Having diverse technical and domain experience, he has organized many uh, professional meetings and seminars at international and national level. 
He is active with professional bodies, including our very own IEEE, ACM, and IET. He is involved in various standards related activities at IEC, ISO, BIS, and various committees as well as task forces. His areas of specializations include information assurance, network security, cyber physical systems, sensor network, safety, critical systems, semantic mining, and data analytics. He is recipient of several research grants in the area of information security. Before joining CDAC, he has worked with ABB, where he received Trailer Blazer Award for Best Innovation and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration FDA as visiting scientists leading their semantic data mining research and development program. He received FDA's Outstanding Service Award for his contribution in 2012. Dr. Sudarshan has a PhD in Applied Computing from USA and Outstanding uh, Award, PhD Graduate Award. He has over 100 publications, presentations to his credit. Prior to joining FDA, he was with CEDP, ERDCI, and CRLBL. Uh, we have with us Dr. Sudarshan online who has joined. In spite of busy schedule, he has joined us. And thanks a lot, sir, for also giving this wonderful venue to organize this event. And, sir, over to you, please. Yeah, uh, very good, good morning. Uh, Namaste, Bengaluru. Uh, so, uh, first of all, you know, thank you very much for uh, letting CDAC uh, host uh, along with I took place at an event. And, uh, and I do know uh, the nitty gritties and the nuances of organizing this. So, thank you, I took and the entire team uh, for the wonderful effort and uh, uh, letting CDAC make use of this uh, opportunity with you. Uh, then uh, the participating teams in so many tracks for joining us and that is uh, wonderful uh, so so with that maybe i'll first thank uh, bindumada sir for you know inaugurating the event today and uh, dr prashant mishra our good friend and also another i uh, chair uh, for computer society um, for giving the first talk today morning and I know we have uh, very able uh, speakers uh, followed by me, uh, including uh, Professor Deepa Sanai, Professor Navin Kumar, and the entire IEEE team supported by uh, several other volunteers. So thank you all, and thank you to the mentors for joining. So uh, maybe I will take the next day about 20 minutes. Uh, uh, but for the bandwidth, you know, uh, okay, I don't know. It's a blessing in disguise. You will not be seeing my face. Uh, you can listen to the audio part. So uh, we are we are looking at a topic uh, which is you know uh, very relevant to the hackathon, which is you know uh, A in uh, various applications. And here I thought we'll touch upon cyber security and A as the idea. So uh, when we talk of uh, artificial intelligence today, people want everything to be you know intelligent using ml a kind of techniques uh, perhaps that is the way uh, we will go from industry to a what we call as an autonomous industry which will be the truly digital industry of the future so to that extent it is very important to know uh, what are the contours of ai and what are the contours of cyber security so that when we apply artificial intelligence from us for cyber security applications, um, which is very interesting, it can abstract and it can give lot many benefits uh, theoretically. But when you come to actual practice, then the engineers and technologists, they have to figure out what are the practical limitations or what are the, as I said, boundary conditions? What are the caveats? And what are the assumptions work? They are extremely important. Technically, uh, so then that is a success for cyber security attackers or the adversary. So more than the AI itself, uh, which all of you are already masters of, it is more important to know uh, the, as they say, the wisdom 
it is not about the knowledge it is about when to apply a given knowledge at what time and what place as they say everything has a place everything has a time everything has a person to it so that is what uh, we need to look at when it comes to a for cyber security as in any other domain so uh, maybe let us start off with you know uh, in principle uh, what is it that we mean by cyber security in a general sense so at outset people talk of a either a triad which uh, most of you are aware is called a cia triad the confidentiality the integrity the availability so confidentiality we talk about uh, how can you keep something secret through encryption yeah, uh, whatever techniques you would like to do um, then integrity is about how do you ensure that the data is not modified and then availability is uh, ability to access on need basis uh, that is what we look at it so so if you really look at uh, uh, from a AI perspective how ca can get positively impacted as well as you know can be exploited is one aspect then we also have the another uh, uh, word for cyber security, not the triad, but it is also people refer to as pain, where it is about privacy, which is very, very important today with the already enacted GDPR in European Union, the HIPAA Act in uh, USA, and the current uh, BDP, PDP bill that is already uh, under review by our Indian uh, uh, parliament. Uh, which will get enacted at one point in time. Uh, but for now, IT Act 2000, uh, the currently updated version, where privacy is a very, very key ingredient, uh, more than the security aspect uh, or the confidentiality aspect. Then in the pit, we also have A, uh, which is about authentication. Uh, then um, uh, we we talk of of course uh, integrity again, sir. Uh, Sudarshan, uh, sir, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Uh, yes, sir, your presentation is not shared, sir. We are not able to see your uh, presentation. Yeah, yeah. Right now, because of bandwidth limitation, I am not sharing the presentation. Okay, sir. Okay. So, so I'm uh, speaking a little slowly. Okay, sir. Uh, okay, sir. Hopefully, what I will do is uh, tomorrow I'll be there at the venue. Uh, I will uh, make a you know three or four slide that summarizing what I spoke today. Uh, for the all the audience for looking at it. Right, sir. Hope it is fine with you. Right, sir. Right. Sir. Okay, because right now uh, I tried even switching on my camera, and I could not see it for myself. That was the quality. Right, sir. Right, sir. No issue. Yeah, yeah. My apologies for it. Yes, sir. Thank uh, you, sir. Please. Yeah, but but coming back to pain, the last one is called the non-repudiation, where we are talking about uh, somebody not able to deny having done some act. So all this is, uh, you know, a characteristic people look at it from financial transaction you know, where we talk about pain or contracts where somebody signs a contract and then we need notary or whatever equivalent and all. So that is the pain. Uh, then if you actually look at from industrial safety perspective, cyber security, there they talk about, you know, safety and availability. So uh, all the security features are to ensure the safety of the systems. So if the system is not safe and if it is not available, uh, it doesn't matter whether it exists or not from an industrial perspective. So that is another way to look at cyber security. So, so one can imagine uh, cyber security itself has you know multiple facets. So a very, very important aspect to remember is, so every artificial intelligence solution that we are looking at, we need to consider the application or domain and the purpose for which it is being used. Let us look at uh, confidentiality, uh, which is one of the most commonly uh, used or, you know, uh, even quantum, we talk about post quantum cryptography, what happens to all those things, uh, encryption algorithms, if quantum comes through and all. So that being the generally discussed, the highly debated topic, let us look at confidentiality or encryption kind of techniques. And what happens with the AI, artificial intelligence? If I look at confidentiality using cryptographic techniques, essentially we are looking at certain assumption again. In the beginning I alluded, uh, the assumptions and the uh, presumptions and the caveats are very important for anything to be successful or unsuccessful. 
So the assumption of any crypto system is the generic algorithm is known to everyone. That means the steps are well known. What is probably not known or assumed to be confidential is the key. Uh, whether it is symmetric or asymmetric, it is the key which is considered uh, the challenge. If the key is broken, that algorithm is considered broken if you are able to recover the keys. A typical analysis starts with, you know, what will be the mathematical uh, limits or computational limits for brute force uh, cracking of the key. Basically, it means the entire spectrum of the key space uh, is completely traversed through. So that definitely since the entire set is their universal set, one of them will be the actual key and you get the real message. So to that extent, brute force is what we start for crypto algorithm, mathematical strength or evaluation as people do it. Uh, then it is also known that or observed that rarely people need to do actually brute force. People have a number of heuristics. So based on the heuristics, the actual time taken is much less than the brute force, which is a complete traversal of the space. Now there comes uh, the artificial intelligence. And mathematically it has been proven that more samples we have of the messages, uh, the more easier it is to crack the key. So it essentially talks about given a key, given a set of messages, what are the if it can be actually predicted or that can be guessed, then that algorithm is broken. The cyber security, uh, you know, threat becomes a reality. So with A, in general, what we do in A, we build some kind of intelligence through learning through certain data sets and also through some mathematical models. So a combination of models, learning, and other related aspects like transfer learning, um, adversarial learning, and many kind of learnings are there. And also the physical properties of the particular key generation mechanism or algorithm uh, related activities uh, or properties, they are all definitely looked at. As the data size is considered generally high when it comes to an AA system compared to a traditional algorithm, the fact that the message and the key space available to the system is larger than in a traditional system, the crypto strength automatically comes down or the chance of breaking the key increases dramatically with AI. So this is not exactly because of AI per se, but it is because the AI is associated typically with the big data and large set of data messages. And second, the ability to do continuous learning. So every data is an active data. It is not a passive dump, uh, which in many cases we, we keep a log or historian of the data, but nobody bothers to actually actively analyze them. But now with a huge cloud-based computing coming up, the data is really messages are actually ready for scrutiny anytime. So with the time as the message size increases the availability of number of messages and add to that the ability to learn and add to that the ability to do prediction uh, using you know whatever intelligence techniques that we are applying whichever algorithm it is together it essentially reduces the uh, strength of the uh, crypto system that is used to achieve the confidentiality so that is uh, one thing we need to keep in mind. So if you are really looking at how do we ensure security of an encrypted system in the presence of A with a large number of data sets, along with you know the so-called crowd computing and uh, uh, high performance computing, then we need to look at crypto systems, which can also be adaptive as much as you know, uh, the A learns and adopts. Why can't the crypto system itself adopt using AI? 
So, as the data size increases, as the compute capability increases, as the learning in increases, we can automatically switch over to a more complex encryption system on the fly. So, we can design adaptive encryption systems that are based on AI to ensure confidentiality. Probably it is one area, whoever is successful can be the next unicorn uh, in this space, in my opinion. Uh, so if I uh, leave out say confidentiality, uh, the other one I'll take it is in the pain uh, if you take it, the privacy aspect. Because privacy also has a lot of uh, legal implications. So when it comes to privacy, privacy is protected today by ensuring that whatever is defined as a private data or the entities in a given data set, which are the entities that are named entities that are defined as private. For example, uh, each law that is enacted in each country has a definition of uh, personal information, uh, which needs to be protected. That is what can be uh, applicable under privacy. Similarly, they also declare sometimes sensitive personal information, so which has, has a higher degree of privacy. So when we look at privacy, the privacy is protected when the defined elements are hidden or you know not given access to unless a person is authenticated and authorized to have viewership. So it, here it is not about secrecy, it is about sharing based on need to know and consented for sharing with the consent uh, action. These are the two important ingredients. Whether the entity is legally authorized to know a particular information or the owner of the personal or sensitive or private information has consented to share the information to a given entity or recipient. Now, what happens with AI? Because AI is a wide spectrum, which is able to link across data sets, able to learn from multiple areas, which are normally seen unrelated, but the hidden pattern can be unraveled. So many times I can estimate a given information, which is private per se, by using already non-private information that are available. I think uh, one of the most uh, famous documented case uh, for privacy violation or you know um, inability to protect was published way back in 2000 where based on you know uh, publicly available data sets were available for example the electoral rolls where the voter id and everything was available and then in addition to that there is another public information on certain insurance and road tax and the locality based on the residences that are available. And then when people in public office, today like we have RTA, certain information is known to everyone because it is a public thing. So uh, the famous case talks about uh, the governor of the uh, state of Massachusetts in the United States. His zip code is available somewhere because he belongs to a particular constituency. And then there are some other public data in terms of uh, voters and other things. And like that, couple of databases were traversed and they were established to make a unique link through which the specific uh, private data of the governor was revealed using a simple cross correlation of databases. If that could be done in the year 2000, which is 22 years uh, earlier uh, as we speak today, think of today when we are highly networked, pretty much uh, every public data potentially is available on any platform one can think of. And we have powerful algorithms without any human intervention to figure out what are the patterns that are hidden between the data sets. That means artificial intelligence will allow the existing way of so-called isolated databases 
to be cross linked unintentionally or intentionally which results in uh, very clear uh, violation of privacy uh, by 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 declaring or by revealing the private data that was actually hidden so given that we have to now do one step up we should actually look at artificial intelligence to see how can we ensure the data is not shared or cross correlated if they are not authorized so even if a data set is public it has to be very clear on this data set is public for this purpose only and that has to be ensured that any other analysis that is tried by anyone should be traceable and should be actionable by whatever uh, no law of the land uh, that is in place we need artificial intelligence techniques which is definitely possible for example people talk about n anonymity or n minus 1 anonymity which means if a data set is given based on the certain sample size we know that if a particular type see because we can always filter based on one of the facets has got n number of uh, samples then a particular number of uh, privacy cannot be uh, revealed because the data is statistically so significant uh, that it is impossible to extract one particular individual sample it will at least result in more than one uh, outcome for a given criteria so ai can be used for example to augment a existing database with a synthetic data set which will ensure that even if somebody tries to do cross correlation techniques the privacy cannot be violated because it will not result in a unique data the moment it is non unique at least technically the privacy is not compromised so now maybe i have smaller sample set to check who is of interest or what property is of interest to us so that way we can augment the real data with synthetic data or when a given data set is given the analysis can be made to say that this data should not be made public because this is vulnerable to so and so privacy violation using ai techniques so there are ways by which we can qualify the privacy capability or ability of a given system or we can augment to reach a level of privacy that is desired uh, in terms of number of record that needed that are needed to break a given privacy so that is one way to look at it uh, so perhaps in the given time i thought uh, i covered because there are no slides also i did not want to make it too complicated so two major things confidentiality in terms of uh, crypto algorithms and key breaking and privacy in terms of uh, a specific record or unique characteristic being disclosed uh by virtue of correlation both can be overcome using ai techniques and uh, this way, this can be extended to each and every cyber security aspect that one can think of that full way to ensure uh safe access to all the cyber technologies because without digital and cyber i don't think humanity can survive given the current for example the pandemic where we need to be you know uh, socially connected and physically a bit distanced because of the isolation requirements so the social connectivity is possible only using digital platforms and cyber space so to, unless you make it secure that will not be a reality to make it secure ai can play a very significant role and uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity i once again thank entire organizing committee and uh, all the speakers Uh, for the great opportunity and the audience for bearing with me for uh, neither showing my face nor sharing the slide deck but i just promise you that tomorrow i will compensate for it uh, and if there are any queries or anything you have quickly i can try to answer it now uh, even otherwise i'll be there tomorrow and i am looking forward to meeting all of you uh, once again thank you and wish you all the best and good luck with the hackathon Thank you very much sir uh
in spite of being uh, uh, remotely you were able to deliver the lecture and a small token of virtual appreciation for you from our side and uh, again once again thank you for hosting us in this wonderful campus uh, so uh, as you told you will be available with us tomorrow so students can interact with you even in a better way so uh, we'll go to the next session which is uh, from dr dinesh babu who is associate professor at uh, Thank you very much, sir. This is so nice of you. Thank you, sir. So uh, we have next with us Dr. Dinesh Babu Jayagopi, who is currently an associate professor at Triple IT Bangalore, where he heads the multimodal perception lab. His research interests are in audio-visual signal processing, machine learning, and social computing. He obtained his doctorate from Ecole Polytechnique Federal UCAN EPFL Switzerland. He received the Outstanding Paper Award in the International Conference on Multimodal Interaction, EDIA Best PhD Student Research Award for the year 2009. More recently, his PhD student's work was nominated for Best Student Paper in ICMI Tokyo, Japan. Another work received Best Student Paper Award at Metre 2018. He also received Department of Science and Technology Young Scientist Startup Grant in 2016. In the past, he has successfully collaborated and executed sponsored research projects with care drdo and ni systems he was also a visiting professor at university of luciana in uh, summer 2019 with this i request sir to take over the session and give us some insights about interviewing using ai thank you sir hello everyone thank you for the invitation uh, looking forward so uh, i would like to talk about how AI could be useful for interviewing and in particular uh, what is called multimodal AI. Maybe just to keep sort of uh, the session interactive, let us say uh, we have a, a virtual avatar okay, here and uh, the avatar has to interview me. Okay? So what sort of technologies would we need to enable this? Can you Yes, maybe few technologies that might be. Yes, you need augmented reality. Okay, I mean, let's say the agent is a virtual agent. Maybe you have to have a virtual reality at least, right? Uh, that's required. Yes. Uh, what other technology? So the agent has to follow what I'm speaking, right? So you probably need automatic uh, speech recognition, right? Voice recognition, speech recognition. What else do you need? Language processing, because you have converted the speech to text, and now you have to process the text, and maybe you have to find out maybe what is my intent uh, or what I'm trying to ask, right? So that you can uh, then maybe prepare a sentence to speak, right? What is called the surface text, which you can speak. What else do you need? So the avatar has to uh, has to speak a sentence, right? So what technology do you need? Mm -hmm. Okay. So based on what the person is uh, answering, you can ask a follow-up question. Yes, that is a possibility. Whether you need reinforcement learning for it or not. That's a, a call you can take, but to just speak out what you have decided to speak right on the avatar, you need what is called a what is that technology to convert from text to speech, uh, PTS technology, text to speech, right? Have you heard about this? I mean, this is quite common, right? Uh, where do you have? Where have you seen it? Probably, yeah, it's very common, right? On mobile phones, on uh, web apps and stuff, you have this already, right? Recognition of speech as well as uh, speaking a sentence. So that is probably there already. Now you have an avatar and the avatar has to say this sentence, right? So you can probably generate the speech, but then the avatar has to move its lips. It, it has to move its lips uh, according to what it is speaking, right? So you need to control the avatar, which could be a 3D model, right? Uh, maybe you have a graphics platform where you can design avatars and you have to do what is called a lip sync, right? 
and also you might have to uh, I mean it might be very boring if you just have an avatar which is like this and just doing a lipstick right you might have to also show some expression on the avatar maybe you have to have some hand gesture going on right so that you can uh, you can make a more realistic and engaging avatar right so that also seems like important and uh, maybe think of a case where uh, i am a interviewee and the avatar is talking to me and uh, i am just like this okay so in that case you also probably need to do a little bit of computer vision right uh, maybe you put a camera somewhere there and observe the candidate right and then at some point i mean you are not just bombarding with questions right one after the other what are your strengths and weakness and, and so on right but you probably at some point you have to understand that the candidate is probably not interested right you have to probably follow the body language of the person or maybe even the facial expression of the person they seem to be not so interested or they seem to be sad they're not happy uh, what is called affective understanding of the user right so you see that uh, there can be uh, several technologies that uh, might have to go in right to just create what is called a interviewing agent right which can just interview it will ask one question and then as somebody said based on the reply that you give you can ask a follow up question right so this is just a interviewing agent but is that all that is required to create uh, uh, to sort of simulate uh, a situation where a human is interviewing a, a candidate they do a little bit more as well right what else do they do questions yes so that is one part of it which is basically the interviewing what i am trying to get at is you also need to do assessment right so uh, an interviewer they not only ask questions but they also assess the candidate right so assessment is also another uh, let's say uh, skill or technology that you need right so so in the talk uh, today we will we'll be talking about these things right where we are talking about uh, to begin with can we interview candidate using just a interface right an interface which will just ask a question so the question is right there on the interface the candidate answers and then maybe you can ask a follow up question right and that is sort of the ai part of it where you're trying to ask a follow up question right or you might also want to assess the candidate right based on their body language based on their reply the word usage uh, and so on so you might want to assess the candidate as well right that's also within the scope of the uh, discussion right and then maybe you might have to uh, change what you speak based on the state affective state of the user if they are sad or if they are having it which is say not neutral maybe you might have to respond accordingly right and then the next technology is how do you maybe start to even control uh, the gestures on the avatar or uh, controlling the avatar aspect right and there is another interesting trend that is also uh, happening these days right have you heard of what is called a gan a generative adversarial network have you heard of this uh, what are they what are gans mm -hmm. just lip sync that's all mm -hmm. so you, you you can just have a image and make the uh, speech uh, mm -hmm. uh -huh. and it can produce say uh, maybe you probably referring to what is called it it will give okay so but maybe as a general concept what are GANs GANs maybe you have heard of image analysis right you given an image you can analyze the image maybe GANs can produce images right they are basically what are called generative models right generative models using what is called adversarial training uh, you produce fairly realistic images right uh, you could produce realistic images you could produce realistic uh, speech uh, you could produce a realistic uh, text and so on right and what we are interested in is can we think of instead of an avatar which is a 3d model using graphics which is which you design can you use a gan model to generate uh, say just like an avatar is speaking 
can you also create a new video, which is sometimes people refer to it, to it as deep fake. I don't know if you've heard of this word deep fake. It is used in different contexts, but basically they are not real videos. They have been artificially created. And uh, one, one interesting possibility is can you use that technology to even create videos, right? That's also an interesting uh, topic. Okay, so let's move on. So, as I told you, there are different ways in which AI can uh, be helpful towards interviewing, right? Maybe you want to do what is called behavior measurement. What is a human doing? Are they smiling? Are they nodding? Are they talking? And so on, right? You might also want to do behavior assessment. Behavior, suppose you have measured behavior automatically using camera, uh, microphone, uh, how they will be perceived, right? So, this is extensively studied in what is called social psychology or personal psychology literature where depending on how people behave uh, you can model how they will be perceived maybe somebody is perceived as a very good communicator somebody is perceived as not so good maybe they are dominating they are influential uh, and so on right and also affect dependent dialogue right maybe uh, you can just decide what to speak based on just the text input or also look at the visual input and see that oh the person is not engaged so maybe i should ask Oh, you don't seem to be interested, right? So you want to talk about something else, right? And then nonverbal behavior synthesis, right? How you say this? Maybe you decided to say something. So how do you say this? Uh, maybe using expression, maybe using uh, gestures, lip sync, and so on, right? And then finally, as we said, uh, we might also want to use GANs, uh, generative adversarial networks, also for nonverbal behavior generation. That's also interesting, right? So these are the types of uh, multimodal AI technologies that we could be interested from an interviewing perspective. So uh, as we said, we want to say automate, automate interviews, right? And face-to-face uh, -face interviews are, I mean, highly desirable, right? Uh, they are very social, uh, but then they are not very scalable in the sense uh, you can't do interviews anytime, anywhere, right? That would be a great possibility if you could do that. And uh, you might be limited by, say, interviewers or a limited collection of interviewers, right? So you could have an interface which is asking a question, and then uh, people are. Right? Uh, so you could, you could have an interface asking questions, and then you collect videos, and there are commercial solutions already which basically analyze the answer and the body language and so on and, and assess people, right? The third in this line of work is uh, basically interviewing virtual agents. You, here it is scalable. You can do the interviews anytime, anywhere. Here it is also scalable and hopefully if you get the avatars to do well, uh, then you get it uh, right in terms of being social as well, right? So that is highly desirable. And in terms of behavior measurement, you can see that, uh, I mean, people have done a lot of work in the psychology literature, in the communication literature, where people have observed, say, two people speaking and then coded uh, at every, uh, let's say, phrase level, whether how is the eyes, how is the bros, uh, what is the position, uh, in order to, say, characterize body language, right? So this is extensively studied uh, work. And uh, it's also well known that uh, nonverbal behavior plays a very important role in human-human uh, communication, right? Uh, in terms of various things that characterize uh, nonverbal behavior, and several times it is also a window to how people perceive, right, about uh, relationships or emotions and so on. And this happens routinely in our human-human uh, -human communication. And these are important because this is how human-human mm -hmm. communication is, which is what we want to model and reproduce and so on, right? And you have. Uh, I mean, you have commercial softwares uh, now which can do uh, what is called human-centered uh, video analysis in terms of, say, getting the facial landmarks, uh, getting the facial orientation, head orientation, uh, body joints uh, identification, and so on, right? So in terms of measuring behavior, how people behave, uh, that's fairly mature uh, now, right? particularly in this close view type of context, right? Uh, maybe in a surveillance context, there you have a far view, but here it is a 
fairly close view and maybe the camera is good and stuff, right? And uh, behavior assessment, right? Where uh, from from maybe various types of uh, nonverbal behavior and how people speak, the kind of words spoken and so on, uh, you are starting to look at works that try to map this into interesting other variables, right? Uh, how people will be perceived, maybe happy, sad, uh, or maybe how well they do a certain action, maybe how well they communicate, or how well they dance, how well they uh, do a sport, and so on, right? And uh, also, in terms of at, at, a, at a larger time scale, you can also maybe look at uh, what their personality could be, uh, whether they dominate interactions, uh, and so on, right? And maybe this can lead to uh, training people, for example, to, to maybe uh, dominate, don't dominate much, uh, but be a good team player and so on, right? That's the kind of things uh, that one can look at. And again, affect dependent uh, dialogue, right? So this is a, a good uh, summary slide where we are trying to summarize what all technologies could be involved in creating a human agent communication, right? Here you can see there are three main technologies, analysis, dialogue, and synthesis, where you could be looking at uh, a, a microphone, a camera, and uh, looking at what the person speaks, ASR, automatic speech recognition, and also natural language understanding, what is the intent of the speaker, and so on, uh, right? And also uh, look at the audio as well, right? And make a sense together uh, with both uh, vi visual as well as uh, audio cues. So this is audio, this is... Uh, camera, sorry. And then finally, you can make a understanding of the user, right? And then plan your dialogue after that, what you want to speak, right? And maybe you want to speak something in a happy state. You want to speak something in a in a sad state, right? And uh, and you, if you could use that to maybe control the expression of the, uh, of the avatar, right? Along with the speech, then you have a fully uh, multimodal system, right? So here you want to fuse cues. You want to fuse the cues and, and make sense of the user. Here you want to do fission, as in whatever is, say, the state of the agent, right, whether it is happy, it should be reflected in how it speaks, what words it uses, and also the expression and gestures and so on. So this is sort of the full, um, we say, the full system that we are talking about, right? And, and uh, this is one classic work, 2014, uh, from uh, University of South California, where they have built a system, where they have built a system uh, where this is an agent and it is interviewing this person and this person is probably in a depressed uh, state, right? And uh, of course, the system is not fully automatic. It had few things which were not automatic, but you get a sense of what it can possibly do, right? So this avatar can talk and then this person uh, also is talking and it is observing his body language, his uh, uh, I mean, his gaze, where he's looking at, uh, whether he's fidgeting, he's moving around, and so on, uh, and so on, right? So this is a very uh, seminal work uh, in this in this area. And uh, now the, the goal is to sort of make this more uh, realistic, more automatic, and, and even have some applications where you have a virtual agent, uh, which could probably talk to people and so on, right? And typically, when we do the analysis, right, on the user side, you might be looking at uh, things at different levels of abstraction, right? You could be looking at just raw behavior, tracking maybe the head angles, probably, or you could also infer maybe whether the attention is high or low uh, and so on, right? And you have this perception mark of language, which could be used to represent uh, different levels of uh, information about the user at various levels of abstraction. And then, uh, as I said, the GAN-based uh, work, right, where you have uh, analysis and synthesis. You might have seen this in your signal processing uh, books, right, multi-rate filter banks and so on, right? So this is something that is not is fairly familiar with to us. But what is happening is now you have, thanks to deep learning, you have uh, deeper models, which can have both highly uh, semantic information, like maybe this is a dog, uh, and also information about the edges and so on, right? Uh, now, uh, thanks to this and the deep models have also uh, lent themselves to even synthesis. For example, you could take an input image, analyze it, and then uh, depending on the problem at hand, maybe if you want to do 
segmentation and you have uh, data where you have the image as well as the segmentation, lots of examples, right? You can learn to model this, right? And you can basically synthesize uh, image as well, right? So maybe you can use it for denoising an image, right? And uh, right, and uh, these adversarial uh, networks are basically networks which can produce images, but using what is called a, an adversarial framework, and you can produce realistic images, right? So these GANs can also be used for uh, looking at interviews, and that is something that we will talk about, right? Okay. So now I'll go a little quickly, basically to tell what sort of things we have done in the lab uh, at the multimodal perception lab. And uh, if you have any questions, we can take them as well, right? So what we have done, we have tried to do assessment, we have tried to do feedback, right? Uh, first work we did was in this framework where you have a interface and using interface, we are interviewing people, right? And uh, what we did in this work was basically used all the, Cues, right, coming from speech, uh, prosody, how they speak, visual cues, uh, lexical meaning, what sort of words they use, and so on. We try to predict if somebody is a good communicator or a bad communicator, right? You want to classify or just do a binary classification. And we did a comparison with face to face interviews, which is sort of the gold standard, and uh, the interface based uh, interviews. And we tried to compare, for example, uh, how people perceive, are perceived or how you can predict. Uh, and this is a, one of an interesting work that we did very early in this space, right? Basically to do assessment, right? As I told you, interviewing is important. Assessment is also important. Then we also try to do a work on um, feedback, right? So it's not only about assessment, which is very good from a, a interviewer point of view, but maybe from an interviewee point of view, maybe you're a candidate, you want to improve things. Can we also give feedback to candidates uh, based on these interviews and tell them exactly, give them exact actionable feedback, right? Tell them that maybe you should improve this, maybe you're good at this, you're probably not good at this, right? So this was another interesting work that we did. Uh, this work um, broadly falls in the category of uh, what is called multimodal machine learning, right? You might have heard machine learning. Uh, this is multimodal as in you have as in you have different cues uh, that might be uh, important, right? As we said, it could be speech, it could be uh, audio, I mean, it could be uh, language, it could be uh, visual cues and so on. So it's a multimodal uh, input. And uh, if you are interested in knowing about more about this area, this is a very good uh, paper you can look at. So today's discussion, we'll skip this. And uh, now let us move on to the uh, avatar setting, right? And as somebody was saying, one of the interesting question is how do you generate a follow-up question, right? Uh, given that the user has said something and you have asked the question, how do you generate a follow-up question, right? And this one, we try to formulate it as uh, using a, a, a deep learned model, a transformer-based model, right? And what do we do here? We basically create these pairs, right? Three pairs, question, response, and follow-up. And we did collect a huge amount of data where you have these three triples occurring, right? And based on that, we tried to uh, build a model which can automatically predict. And here you can see the uh, question, response, and uh, the generated follow-up, which is an automatically generated uh, follow-up, which is a reasonably acceptable question, right? And uh, this is human-generated follow-up question, right? So the goal is to create uh, follow-up questions which are reasonably acceptable. At the same time, what it brings to the table is if you don't have follow-up question, you are only asking predetermined questions. It is boring for the interviewee, that is one. Also, it is not putting them into a difficult situation, right? Because if you are uh, asking some standard questions, they will be prepared for it. Now, if you can ask a follow-up question which is based on what reply they are giving, it, it comes closer and closer to a realistic uh, interview, right? So this is something that uh, we did. And uh, uh, of course, in terms of the details, how we do and stuff, so we have these uh, three uh, question, response, follow-up, which is a triple, and then we use uh, GPT-2 model, and we have these language modeling loss and the next sentence classification loss. So we, we know what is the valid follow-up, 
we know what is not a valid follow-up. We just encode that information to uh, basically learn a model which can generate valid follow-up. Okay, and this is a, a work that we are uh, currently uh, building. What is called a Margadarshi platform, and uh, this platform is useful to interview candidates in a UPSC setting. I want to control this. You have to come out. Play this. Yeah, you can just play it. So here you can see that uh, we have built a, a virtual reality type of Full screen, is it? I just want to move a little bit. So here you can see there was a follow-up question based on the answer that the interviewee gave, right? And uh, here we do have options uh, for the candidates to choose. I mean, history, constitution, uh, various topics, right? And uh, we did work with an academy called India for IAS Academy. And uh, currently, this solution is in the field, right? So the idea is maybe if you have somebody in a rural uh, a place they are not able to access city maybe due to covid or in general as well right you could do multiple such interviews uh, before you actually come to the uh, academy right so you could do lots of interview practice uh, before you come and you're probably prepared right because sometimes if you see uh, i mean people have given us feedback that uh, i mean they initially thought it will be easy cakewalk right you just go and start but then once you get into it you, it, it really uh, what do you, say? you have to be prepared, right? You just cannot answer randomly and so on because it's going to ask, keep asking you follow-up questions and stuff, right? So, uh, so currently it is being used as well. So this is something that has come out of the lab and and into the field uh, already, right? Okay. Okay. So any questions on this? If you might have, yes. Correct. Correct. 
Correct, correct. Yeah. So in terms of extending the scope of the work, those are directions that that, that we are looking at, right? So for one, we could have an option where they upload their CV, right? And then you could ask questions based on the particular CV that the person has uploaded, right? Or you could also have maybe depending on the job profile somebody is wanting to apply to, you can have technical questions which are related to that job profile. Here what we are talking about is a behavioral interview to begin with uh, where we ask questions in terms of say what are your strengths, which are the typical interviews that happen at the end, right, the HR interview, right. That's what we have worked on in the previous work. With the Margadashi platform, it is a, a topic related work, constitution or history and and so on. But as you are rightly saying, there are, I mean, what you say, you can extend it to simulate how real world interviews happen, right? People look at their profile and then ask very specific questions. Sometimes you also have situation where one person will ask one question and then somebody else will ask from a different aspect. So it is all about creating uh, more, more and more realistic interviews, which is a work in progress. Yes. So this particular work uh, is in the realm of basically using uh, so if you if you see the models that are used to generate text there are two types of models right what is called dialogue management you could use what is called a task based uh, dialogue where you find out what is the intent and and sort of fill some slots and so on so that is one type of work the other type of work where you could uh, use what is called a, a generative model right gpt2 or a transformer based generative model we have used that model and these are good at applications where you're just giving comp company to people, right? Maybe an elderly and uh, you just want to talk to them, keep talking what is called a chit chat type of application, right? So in those applications, it's also important to consider the affective state of the person so that uh, you can react accordingly, not just about follow up, uh, follow up question or follow up sentence, but also ensure that you are in the right affective state, right? Uh, and we had a data from which we could learn so that the agent can be in the right affective state. So I'm not giving a lot of details, but I'm just telling the kind of work that, that we are doing, right? And uh, this is the final part I just briefly mentioned, which is multimodal uh, synthesis. In terms of time, how are we? We have finished the time. Yes. Do I have one or two minutes? That is good. Or okay. Five minutes. Okay, thank you. So this is multimodal synthesis, right? And uh, here you can see that uh, multimodal uh, synthesis basically means that you have a sentence, and for every word in the sentence, and for every word in the sentence, you have to assign a nonverbal behavior, right? Maybe you have to look at the grammar, right? What each word uh, is belonging to, and then maybe you have to you have to say when to gaze at uh, outside or when to gaze down or move your eyebrows, move your hands and so on, right? So this is what is called multimodal synthesis and uh, typically this is based on some rules uh, based on the language that people use. Uh, but I'll probably skip this and maybe just show you, for example, how people have tried to model uh, sentences into what are called ideation units, right? And then for every ideation unit, you could have some gestures which get along well and so on. Right? So this is uh, on the multimodal synthesis work. Okay. So what is also emerging is what is called nonverbal behavior generation using end-to-end -end models. Right. Suppose you have a data set where you have the video of a person who is speaking, and uh, you also have you also have the sentence that they, they are speaking. Right. Now you can learn a model where if you know what to speak, you can predict what sort of facial expression you should have, right? Just learn from data end-to-end -end models. And similarly, you can also, you can learn what are called end-to-end -end models uh, for gesticulating or basically moving your hands while you are speaking, right? You can have end-to-end -end models for listening, when you have to do nodding, right? When you have to do smiling, uh, just based on data, right? You can learn these models. And we have been looking at, uh, in the lab uh, where we can use sign language, we are trying to do a transfer of signs from a video to an avatar. And uh, so this is controlling the expression 
and uh, the previous one was controlling the uh, gestures and so on, right? So, so that we can in the future learn models uh, in an end-to-end -end fashion so that you can control avatars which can do interviews, right? So that is sort of the uh, goal. Okay, so I'll probably stop here. I think uh, this is a good point to uh, stop. And if you have any more questions, Okay, thank you everyone. We have time for one or two questions. Any questions from the audience? Okay, so uh, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. I mean, uh, Again, thanks to COVID, I would say, because all these innovations are happening because of COVID. Maybe before that also servers working, but this is something amazing, which we saw the demo. Uh, I would like to request uh, Dr. Sanjay is around. Okay. So I would like to request uh, Dr. Bindu Madhava to please uh, give a small memento from our side to uh, Dr. Dinesh. Thank you, sir. So before we wind up this symposium, we have one more amazing talk by Dr. Naveen Kumar, who is a professor at Amrita School of Engineering, Bangalore. Let me introduce him briefly. So Dr. Naveen Kumar serves as a chairperson and professor at the Department of Electronics and Communications, School of Engineering, Amrita Vishwa Vidya Pitam, Bangalore. Dr. Naveen obtained his PhD in Telecommunication Engineering from University of Porto, Averio and uh, Minho, Portugal, Europe. Uh, Dr. Naveen has over 24 years of working experience in government, industry, academia, in IT and telecommunication area. He has over 10 years of overseas experience in teaching, research and development. Naveen has over 100 plus publications in uh, uh, peer reviewed international journal and IEEE conference proceedings. In addition, he has also authored a book, edited books and book chapters. He has been awarded Franofer Challenge Award uh, in academic year 2010-2011 for the best uh, thesis. He also received a grant from government of Portugal towards his PhD research work. Naveen is recipient of Gauri Memorial Award India in year 2009 for the best journal paper and many best international papers of conferences. His fellow of uh, Institute of Engineers, uh, Charter in Engineers, IE India, fellow European Association for Innovation, senior member of IEEE, life member of IET India, and life member of AIENG HK. With this, I request uh, Sir to take over and give us some overview of prototyping and product development. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Avishek. Thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon to all of you. So I think you have heard a lot of AI, ML, DL, and so on. So now we are going to be real world. So what, what are you going to do? In next 24 hours, perhaps some 5 to 10 percent of that you are going to do in this process. What we are going to do, okay? So that is what I say real time. So it is about prototyping and product development. So what is pro prototyping, and when it is it is start? Now our work, research, even at PhD level also, is very limited. Maybe because of resources, maybe because of infrastructure, or so on. So because of that, what happens is, we are limited to theoretical study, mathematical analysis, using some tools to simulate and publish or patent, whatever. But today, I think, we have to change this scenario and we have to think beyond that what we have been doing. And I basically try to, to convince and say the people, even undergraduates, that don't go for placement, rather target a startup. How to target a startup or do some startup, it is not easy. 
it is not that overnight overnight work that we do right there is a huge process long process before we think of that in fact some three months before i underwent some training of two months exhaustive two two months and uh, that training was about a startup how can you think of a startup so we are doing some work in the lab we develop a product we are in the stage of developing a product and we think that it is our best product and everybody will buy it but when we started this training they said forget about your product in next two months you are not going to talk about product at all then what are we going to do so for two months we started discovering customers so that is called customer discovery and then we found that it is really true what they are trying to say at the end we thought that earlier when we started and we are developing product thinking that everybody will use why they will not use but at the end we found that hardly 5 to 10 percent might be so that is the situation so this what i'm trying to say is this startup is not easy product development is not easy but okay as a engineer we should definitely practice that and we have to do that so not to limit our study on simulation and so on we have to think of out of box we have to learn how to wire what to wire how to make things work and when you try to make things work we have to damage so many things so there is no problem damage whatever you wish in that process we learn okay so in this part briefly we are going to discuss about those prototyping and the step that we follow in product development so there are a lot of confusion in prototype what is prototype so basically a prototyping is a process in which design teams ideate experiment with and the bring the concept to life ranging from paper idea to a digital design it is a fourth step in design thinking process many of you might have attended design thinking workshop it starts half day two day five day even a month design thinking so this is also one of the part of design thinking. the prototype is an early sample so we do not wire everything we don't make it solder everything but we try to mimic it you can say that okay if we develop this at the end whether it will work or not so even we see that our btech student mtech student when they practice they do the project they will use breadboard and so on and when they are actually presenting they will say that this wire loose madam this wire gone this is not working power supply battery drain off it happened either purposely or maybe it has happened like that so it is fine but we should ensure if not on breadboard we can try even soldering up there is nothing wrong in that so the key characteristic of prototype is that prototypes are created without a single line of code so we don't normally code it we do not normally program it we directly go sometimes to design the hardware okay so it is necessary tool to validate the idea so concept is there idea is there but how to validate it so for example you came up with the idea right we ask you to to you know send your idea concept what you want to do but now in next 24 hours you are going to validate that the idea that you generated the idea that you have now whether it is going to work how much it is going to work i have five characteristic design in mind it worked well in simulation now how many characteristic you will produce that we have to see right so validation testing prototype lets us benchmark the progress and usability before moving forward to the development so basically a prototyping typing our product is all about learning 
so there are various stages we will go step by, by step we see that we debug something works something does not work something work to our expectation something do not work what has happened so it is a learning process this time we create a prototype version we will or at least should learn something new always start with a simplest and cheapest so since this is a one of the steps of design thinking so i would like just highlight in one slide what is the design thinking so the design thinking ideology is such that a hands on hands on user centric approach to problem solving can lead to innovation and innovation can lead to differentiation and a competitive advantage the hands on hands on what we say that when you are in the lab don't do simulation you should wire it you should solder it you should learn the component you wire it measure it validate it give the signal take the output so that is what we we try to do in the lab so the process normally we have is understand explore and materialize that you can look at in this diagram design thinking i took it from here sometimes follow so you have emphasize to have define ideate prototype test and implement all of these six steps that you have in this process of design thinking all into broader three class or or, or concept you can say understand explore and materialize this means some idea has come in our mind something either by reading discussing or somewhere let's say we are not born science einstein right what has happened something but it, it is possible that you are sitting somewhere alone something it comes in your mind so this is one way that idea is generated otherwise if we are not of that scale how the idea comes it comes with a discussion so group discussion or discussion among the friends or colleagues it is also very important it is not necessary that when we are discussing we should have the same field or same technical background not necessary if you discuss your idea with anyone you might get different input and then you will relate oh this is correct can i use this concept in my design or my thinking right so the idea comes from there if not that discussion then you have to read lot of literature so when you read lot of literatures from there also you generate some idea so we gen generate so when some idea concept comes we have to explore it how much whether it is going to work it is not going to work so we have to put into put efforts to ensure that we have sufficient knowledge sufficient understanding about that concept and then try to design try to develop try to materialize so this emphasis empathize so conduct research in order to develop knowledge about what your users do say think and feel i i give you example that when we are developing already we are thinking that our is the best pro product why people will not use it but during this training of 2 to 3 months we find that nobody is going to use so the question is then why are we developing it right but yes there are customer definitely they will use but if you try to classify those customers into a primary customer secondary or first stage who need really what is the need level of those person so if we categorize we find that hardly you have 5 to 7 percent people who might really in need of this product so this is not the development or successful development or startup it says that first find your customer if you are developing a product you have to go you have to become a customer don't think like that developer customer will they use if they you they want is it required for them that is what we have to understand 
so this is what it says do say and how they feel about the product then define combine all your research and observe where your users problem exist so normally we start developing product without taking into account whether there is a need of this or there is no need we develop the product let us develop it we will sell it later on but we find lot of difficulty in this process first we have to find who are going to use it that is very important if we find even 10% of people who are badly require this product you are going to be successful so that is the activity that we suppose that is what it says why they need because they have the problem sir mentioned that the previous talk the interview yes ai based intelligence based interview it is a very good requirement today we have especially during this uh, pandemic because we can't travel neither those people interview are going to travel or interview going to travel so it might be required but is it required for academic institution is it required if we have a startup we do this this may not be so tomorrow they might use it but today who are the people might use immediately this package what sir has developed now right so so that is what we we need to understand ideate brainstorm a range of crazy creative idea that address the unmet users needs identified in the defined set so group discussion and brainstorming on to those idea that you have developed that needs to be discussed in detail and then you start prototype so that is what it says it is a fourth stage in this process of design thinking so build real tactile representation for the subject of your idea we will see more to this then once you have a small prototype or your prototype then we test it expected output are you getting it what we expected are we getting or how much close we are getting to that expected output right that is the testing and finally you have to implement go for further development so this is a design thinking process that leads to finally the product development so what is the importance why do we do it so in general i'll say when we study when we do something we start with simulation end up if not end up we are very crazy to go further we go for prototype so you have a combination of hardware software and then you try to test in maybe lab environment maybe outdoor environment whatever depending upon your system that is it we try to test it that how much it might work in the real environment that is a prototype so it's a, and you have seen that it is a learning stage each time you modify each time you update we learn and we try to optimize our hardware our software so basically we are in this process we are going to lower the risk risk of the cost risk of the functional risk of the product that we are going to make it right so prototyping is is also called as a experience of learning or experience it is of course iterative process in academic institution or environment what we do so we have found or we are experienced that if you have something developed prototype at least and then you go for a grant proposal the institution or organization or they might fund it but with the concept or with only the idea funding becomes very very big so that is where we we find the advantage of this that if you have some prototype if you have made it something then you write a proposal and there is a possibility of getting some somebody might fund fund okay 
so securing the fund each prototype has a purpose whether it is to demonstrate the product functionality used for marketing purpose a secure funding test ergonomics test something some assumptions or gather more data about the product so there are various regions and types based upon which we try to develop the prototype so you might have heard this poc proof of concept that is what we we also call the proof of concept so concept or idea you have how much you have validated it so what is the proof you have or is that proof only lie in your mind if it is here then it is not valid nobody is going to some somewhere sometimes you 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 hear in research methodology workshop there is something called copyright there is something called uh, not copyright or patent right so you see sometimes we get a, a controversial uh, uh, argument or something that oh this this song it is my song but they have copyrighted it now why it is because you kept in your mind you did not disclose it so if you did not disclose and somebody disclose then you can't claim it so it is we have to take it out from what what is there in your mind right don't keep it inside the mind so proof of concept or poc prototype is often the first tangible representation of an idea for electronics product it is usually made using of the self component or development so what is today available we have raspberry pi you are using arduino you are using and electronic component abc you are using and trying to make it that is what you are going to do also the only purpose of poc is to demonstrate the core functionality of the product idea the next type is also known as works like or functional prototype that is why the prototyping boards allow great flexibility with use of various sensors or cells they are not economically feasible efficient when transition to a mass production so it is a working model we also call it as a working model so how much what are the functionality you have that you made it and what are the functionality that you can get from this prototype then we have looks like a prototype or appearance this is another type so you can make with a paper you can make it, you see for example some uh, uh, in some company you go or organization you go uh, at the interest itself you have the model of this right so i will make a building of this kind i will make a, a complete system of this kind it is not going to work it is not working but it is it looks like your product right so that also we have we'll go little faster alpha prototype it is a combination it is of looks and work so we have seen what is a looking proto prototype and what is a working prototype so if you combine that is alpha prototype so also known as engineering prototype or if it is a combination as i said this is the type of prototype that is most commonly used for funding or crowd funding or kick start or the demo or so on so when anyone anyone is organizing for most of the company today they are organizing like a startup or ideation or so on so if you have developed some prototype you can go to do that organization or call and you demonstrate so this is this this is what we have developed and it is functional today and if you fund us then i will able to develop convert into a product right so that is important the custom design pcb is integrated into uh, your, your your what you say uh, enclosure uh, so this is something for example it, it is given that uh, uh, you have a toothbrush right a 3d cad model for electric toothbrush so a product when you are trying to design and develop uh, a one or two you might have different different uh, blocks for that to show it and to combine 
then we have also beta prototype the beta prototype is very similar to alpha prototype in terms of appearance and functionality but major difference is that overall design has undergone dfm optimization and prototypes are made of manufacturing process that closely resembles the process of product so it means it is little bit fine tuned from the alpha prototype normally in this beta prototype we have different evaluation that it has to go your prototype or, or the process of product development it has to go through engineering validation testing engineering validation testing means when we design something for example you might refer data set of a product there is a electrical characteristic specification mechanical characteristic specification and so on you might not pay attention to something for example there is a product in data set it says it can work for it with a temperature of minus 50 degree to 150 degree we don't pay attention but when you are a user you have to pay attention to this now you might ask whether the product developer has it tested this yes without testing they cannot specify in the data sheet so this means that they have put that product into that environment they have the closed environment of that kind and tested that product then only they are it is coming to the user right so so these are the validation done in the process of product prototype design validation the prototypes undergo a battery of test that put them under serious stress product validation testing this type of testing is done on the first pilot run of the production line using actual production tool so when we we develop there are several such validation testing engineering design validation and product validation is done then before coming to a product type we have a pre production prototype pre production prototype so it is you can say very close to your product so this is the closest we can get to replicating the end product that we are going to manufacture at this stage they still molds and so on so we can say that if we have reached to this stage we have fine tuned no more modification we are going to do it means our design is optimized so you have frozen all your concept design circuit whatever you have frozen so that is the very close to the production so that is a very brief about uh, the prototype now in the product development so what happens to product development how what are the processes we have preliminary product design so we have done the prototyping in the prototyping we have seen that we have reached to a very close to the product level we have optimized most of the our design we have validated it but really it is not a customized pcb it is not a form of product so how to bring that to a product level right so preliminary product design if focus on product production component cost profit margin performance feature development feasibility manufacturing all of this so this means that if we are okay with the prototyping validated it also something we did not do what we did not do we do not know right now how much it is going to cost we do not know right now that how long will it take me to develop my product because this prototyping i have been doing this for last 6 months now is that one product or 10 product if i develop it will take 6 months if it takes 6 months am i going to be successful right so these are the question that we try to answer before we bring into product development can i mass manufacture the product can i sell it at a profit margin so 
Now, what you did in pro prototyping is you know something, you have the block diagram and you combine this, all this. But when we start, we start from here. So you have a complete block diagram and you list out what is going from where, what is coming to that block. So all signaling, all information you have. So that is what the step, we, we call it system block diagram. Then you try to find out what are the components will be used. Which are the components? Because if we identify, then only we will be able to, to understand how much it is going to cost for us, one product, right? So we have to identify, select the various product components in this, estimate the production cost. So after you list out all the components, then you will be able to understand how much it will cost. So estimate the cost. Next step is design the schematic. So then we have to design the schematic of what we have developed. Then you go to the PCB design. So this PCB design, of course, all we are not doing it, right? We outsource, but you are giving all the design circuit schematic, outsourcing it, and they will design that PCB for you. Once they design PCB, you can generate the final bill of material, and then you order the PCB, so PCB will come to you, Again, now you make it functional, debug it, test it, evaluate, check the result. So all of these, of course, in this product development, we are not doing, we are outsourced. But every schematic when you have, the schematic you are going to give it, the diagram, complete diagram you are going to give it, and based upon what you are giving, they will design the PCB. Once they design the PCB, even you can ask them to wire or you wire, you get, you order the PCB, you get it. Now, when you get it, you might order 10, you might order 50. Of course, it depends upon how many you are you order, the cost will be accordingly. But normally, when you receive it, again you have to make it operational, debug, and see how much differences, where are the differences you have. If you find the differences in the expected output, again you have to repeat the process from the design, pre-design stage. This means that your optimization is not complete. You have to optimize again, again you go, design the PCB, send it, get ordered of the PCB, validate it, so normally it is found that in two to three iteration we get what is expected. So once uh, you you got it validated, then you have already in the prototyping enclosure you have made it. Now put the enclosure show box whatever you have it, and product is ready for you. You can go for the mass production. You order it and you are done. So this is normally uh, the process that uh, we follow in real world. Before product, we have to actually find the customer. So customer discovery is very important. After that, only you can be a successful startup and your product can go to market. So this is a very brief information. I follow a couple of blogs. Uh, Peter and so on on this, uh, and I took that those information from there. So with this, thank you very much for your attention. Hope to be useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, any of you have any question? Quick question. Our uh, sir is available uh, even after the symposium. Also, you can interact with him. With this, I request uh, Divya, ma'am. Uh, to please give a moment to, to Dr. Naveen for his excellent session on design thinking. So our knowledge, uh, we have gained a lot of knowledge over from morning. We should also fill our tummies.
But before that, we have Dr. Kumudini Ravindra, who is Chief Strategy Officer and Co-Founder of Inyo2 Inc., as well as WIE Chair of IEEE Bangalore Section Affinity Group. So, ma'am, please propose out of time. Yeah, like uh, Abhishek mentioned, uh, I'm who stands between your lunch and uh, the last bit. Um, it has been a very invigorating and inspiring session so far, uh, both online and offline. Um, it's interesting to see faces. It's interesting to see physical people rather than, uh, you know, online systems and looking into screens so far. So I think all of you must have enjoyed this experience. I don't know how many of you have had this experience. So first of all, I'd like to thank the Lord Almighty for his grace and her grace um, making this event possible itself. Um, with that, I'd like to start by placing on record our sincere thanks to CDAC for co-hosting this event along with IEEE Bangalore section and providing us with the venue and extending the hospitality um, to all the participants, uh, you're providing us with the space uh, for people to work in. Uh, the Paramutkarsh is available to all of us to uh, utilize and uh, all the teams. So thanks a lot to CDAC. Uh, thanks also to IEEE Bangalore section under the leadership of Dr. Deepa Shanoi and her vibrant Exocom team. Um, they have been enabling um, many outcome-based events, and this is one of them. And it's it's very interesting that we want to make mm -hmm. this an annual event uh, because I think all the students are going to benefit from this. Um, so I'd like to thank the IEEE Bangalore section team um, headed by Dr. Deepa Um I'd also like to thank uh, Divya Ma'am for initiating this event. You know, it was her brainchild, and she has... Uh, you know, she has really made this happen. She has brought the people together under one roof. Um, and she has, uh, you know, gone beyond her call of duty, so to speak, to really make this happen. So thanks, ma'am, uh, for making this. And uh, we have always learned from you. And I like, I mean, I always say this. Uh, I always like the unassuming way in which you make things happen. But they usually end up being a grand success. And I want to place this on record. Um, so thanks a lot, Divya, ma'am. Um, so, you know, the AI Symposium was the first event. Uh, the hackathon is going to follow. Um, and the AI Symposium, the inauguration, uh, we had Bindu Madhava, sir, being a chief guest, and he laid a wonderful foundation and uh, told us about, and he implied AI for good is all about, AI for good is all about, uh, gave us a few uh, inputs on Stratified Auto, cognitive computing, and I think all of these are good input to students to kind of make to your, uh, you know, uh, back to your projects and so on to really think about it. So thank you, Bindu Madhava, sir, for your inaugural address. Um, the symposium was an opportunity also to listen to experts, uh, to listen to people who are on the field, uh, both research and application-wise. I think uh, we learn a lot from their work. Um, we have uh, Dr. Prashant Mishra and his talk on logistic, you know, plan how EV can be used for last mile connectivity and how they can really, uh, you know, use of uh, managing this last mile connectivity of delivery and utilize maybe the fact that it's an electric vehicle, utilize that to, you know, um, give, meet the demand of electricity as well. You know? so, so that was a very interesting talk. Adoption online from CDAC and, and he talked about uh, AI for uh, cyber security. Um, so on, um, on record, our gratitude to Dr. Dinesh Babu from IIITB, uh, who elaborated on how AI can be utilized for interviewing and uh, for demonstrating the Margadarshi app. Uh, thanks also to Dr. Naveen Kumar, who illustrated the utility of prototyping 
product development. Uh, this is indeed a very important uh, aspect that many of us miss out. I mean, as engineers, as much as this uh, assignment, we tend to forget that, you know, you need to design for a user. Uh, so highlighting that aspect, I think, is very critical. Um, I'd also like to thank our sponsors for supporting this event. So we have CDAC, IEEE Bangor section, the many IEEE societies, the Power and Energy Society, the Computer Society, TEMS, Site, Industry Application, Vehicular Technology, uh, Feminine Engineering, and, and Raman University of Life Sciences, your support both financially and otherwise. I'd like to also thank the jury for uh, providing your time and guiding the students and actually evaluating these projects. Um, first of all, thanks are due to Dr. Sudarshan and Dr. Aluknath Day, uh, the final jury members who will be evaluating this uh, the projects, the student projects. Um, thanks also are due to Dr. Uh, Divya MG, Dr. Naveen, Dr. Pushpamala, who are um, the final jury members. We also have the other jury members who are Changappa, Sumit, Surabhi Dvivedi, Dr. Vivek Yadav, Sagar D, Dr. Abhishek Apaji, Nitin Rao, Ramesh Naidu, Dr. Ashwini Apaji, and Mohit Ved. Thanks also to all the college and community mentors who are going to be supporting the students on the projects. Um, Um, I'll also like to start with saying no event is possible without the tireless striving of its organizational and uh, operational teams. Um, so we'd like to thank the organizing committee. So we had uh, Dr. Sudarshan, Dr. Deepa Shanoi, Dr. Aloknath Day, Dr. Naveen, Dr. Janki, and Ms. Divya from CDAC, uh, who are part of the organizing committee. Thanks a lot for making this event possible. Uh, the operational committee had Dr. Abhishek Deshmukh, Dr. Abhishek Apaji, Dr. Ashwini Apaji, Changappa, Purnalata, Prashant Mishra, Raj Shekhar, Ramesh Naidu, Rinki Sharma, Satish Kalidas, Shrikant, Vijay Lakshmi, Vinay, Vinay Jadav, Shrikant Angde, and uh, S.T. Ra uh, Raghavendra Prasad. Uh, thanks a lot for working. Um, volunteers, especially students, they give a different flavor to any event. Uh, they are the hands, feet, and heart of any event is what I would like to say. Uh, thanks to all the student volunteers, especially the ones from Dayanand Sagar who came all the way here to uh, help us conduct this event. Um, also to the students of Ramaya University of Applied Sciences. Uh, I'd also like to thank the students, uh, student volunteers from the SAC uh, team who have supported uh, in creating the promotional material, the posters, and everything that you have been seeing. So thanks also to that team. Uh, thanks, of course, are due to all the participants and students who submitted your proposals and who have registered for the event. Uh, this event would not have been possible but for your presence. And it is for you that we are conducting this event. So thanks a lot for registering for this event. And we have 25 plus teams that are going to be here attending the hackathon so all the very best to you guys may the best guys win and i think we are going to take a lot um, not just at ieee i think this is going to do society a lot of good if the kind of solutions that you come out with are going to be useful to society um, i'd also like to thank uh, i know this is a very long uh, word of thanks but uh, sincere thanks to the hospitality team the photography and videography team and the technical administration team uh, for your able support. Um, we also like to thank the online and offline participants. Um, and uh, we would like to request you to continue to support us and encourage us um, at IEEE Bangalore section. Um, this is what we are here for. We kind of want to um, make these events happen because we think that we are trying to provide our limited best to society. So thanks for your support and thanks for your encouragement. Um, and I hope next two days are really effective um, for networking, learning, and growing. All the very best and thanks a lot and hope you enjoy a great lunch. Thank you, Man, for give, delivering wonderful vote of thanks and also helping us uh, for this event. So the next talk is, okay, I'm sorry, it's not talk, but, uh, 
uh, now the serious business is done. So people online, we are done with the symposium. Now it's all fun, which is going to start. But before that, let's again clap one round of applause for the wonderful symposium, which has happened. And thank you for patiently sitting. So some of the housekeeping announcements uh, is that uh, one must and should thing you should be doing each one of them in this hall is give the feedback. As in when you proceed outside, you will see some QR code stuck, which is the same QR code throughout. You go scan it and then give your feedback, which is very, very important. And what do you get out of it? Few of them will do using Lucky Dip. We'll give you an amazing gift, you know, very interesting gift we have, which we are giving from IEEE Bangu section. Please make sure that you give feedback, which is very important, so that we can come back to the same venue. Hopefully, we are requesting CDAC to host the same symposium every year. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you again in the next year with a better version, improved version, more mega version of this event. And the uh, next thing is before we move out for lunch, which is just adjacent to this block in the open gardens, we have wonderful setup done next to the fountain, which is switched off now. But uh, uh, there we have uh, uh, arranged everything for the group photo. We will show this on the social media. We'll make much more noise from IEEE Bangalore section and see that, that we did amazing symposium today. So after group photo, then we'll go for the lunch. So any doubts and uh, after that, we'll come back exactly. And you see the watch. We are almost around the same time. Thanks to all our speakers for being on time. After the lunch, exactly at two o'clock, all the hackathon participants, mentors, juries, all of them will come back to the same room for very small orientation of few minutes. Then we'll start hackathon. Yeah. Yeah. Hackathon participants, jury members, mentors, please come back. Symposium uh, participants, please uh, uh, come for the photograph, have your lunch. And in case you win from the, we'll wait till 1.30, whoever gives the feedback in that we'll take lucky dip and you can come and inquire. We would have displayed the names. If your name is there, you can come and collect your gift from the front end registration desk. Okay. Fine then. You still want me to talk? Okay. Let's go. Feedback and photograph. 